So, all right, we have started. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Cape Elizabeth School Board meeting Tuesday, July 28th, 2020 at 6.30. It's our regular business meeting via Zoom video conferencing. Can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? We're gonna use Donna's beautiful flag. Can you see it? I can see it. It's in shadow, but I see it, it's beautiful. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So first off, um, I just want to say like a little piece. Um, I can't, I can't see everybody's hand raising. So um, especially, I think this is more to the board members. It's not all your faces are not right here for me to see you raising your hands. So if at any time um, a board member needs to speak or has something to say, um, I'm going to invite you not to necessarily be called on like we typically are since we are up to 88 participants right now. Um, and I'll, you know, give some time and space, but um, just chime in. You'll have to because I won't be able to see hands raised. Um, I won't be able to scroll down and I'm sure I'll miss somebody. So please um, speak up when need be. Uh, so the first item is adjustments to the agenda. And I want to see school board members. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Okay, I have one potential adjustment to the agenda, which is we often start with public comment um, right after this. And my adjustment is a suggestion, and I want to hear from the other school board members how you feel about that. I might do a impartial roll call. Um, Donna and I were speaking, thinking that many of the questions could very well be answered in the presentation and the information tonight. So I am wondering if for tonight's meeting, because there are so many participants and we have a lot to get through and that some of the answers, as I just mentioned, might be um, answered within from the administrators and Superintendent Wolfram, that we wait for comments for um, till afterwards. Uh, and that way we can we can hear as much as we need to hear from everybody. I'm, I'm curious about thoughts. I'm not wedded to that idea. Um, we were just thinking that might be efficient. So um, maybe I'll start with Kimberly. Do you want to speak to that? To that. Yes, I think that's an excellent idea. I think, um, you know, just from the letters that we've received, a lot of the um, comments and ideas and questions seem like they um, may be duplicates in the presentation. Hopefully we'll answer a lot of those questions. Okay, so you're okay with that idea. Elizabeth. I think it's a great idea to have comments come up, but we do have different action items. And so we, we would want to invite comment um, probably after somebody has made the motion, but before we vote. That's, I'm just putting a procedural thought out there. Okay. Um, let, I, I'm okay with that. And if for somehow I, I missed that because it's not traditional, please help me and catch me on that. Um, and then the majority of the comments can be done after. Yeah. Sounds good. I like that suggestion. Um, Hope, where do you stand? Uh, your hope? I agree yeah. with the suggestion. I'm sorry, I was finding the mute button. Um, that sounds good to me. Okay. Great. And Nasser? I just saw you. There you are. Are you okay with the suggestion of holding comments? I am, as long as we're not breaking too many rules. And I would like to add for the fact that if there are dying questions out there, and because we would like to oblige them, they can actually type it in in the chat to be shared with everyone or just with you or somebody else too. So that might help. Yes. And I, I think Elizabeth's suggestion of hearing comments before the vote um, 
makes sure that the comments are heard and they they hold value um, and then they're not done at the end that's a great point elizabeth but once we've already voted because then then it's not as powerful absolutely okay so thank you um who's next laura are you okay with that yes i agree with the plan okay thank you and phil yeah i agree <clears throat> i just want to clarify i think you mean are you do you mean move it to the uh, after the consideration to approve the plan for fall reopening of school and before the review of the policies? Yeah, so I think okay. they'll, now what it will be is that there will be multiple opportunities for comment, but they will be specific to the action item. So yes, for Great. item A, when we're talking about calendar, if people wanna comment on that action item before we vote, we'll open it up to public comment. That sounds great, I'm fine with that. Okay, fantastic. Um, then let's begin since we're going to skip to comments from the public and move on to new business. May I have a motion, please? And just speak up because I can't see hands. I'm not going to call on you. I move we approve the calendar changes proposal for school year 21. Can I have a second? Second. It's Laura. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Um, discussion. Um, Donna, can you speak a little bit to the proposed calendar changes and explain why we're coming back to the calendar for the public yep. and school board I members? I'm going to try to share my calendar. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so in light of all of the many changes that um, we're experiencing and going to experience this year, um, we talked about um, changing the calendar and this was um, discussed at AT meetings and also with the district uh, planning team. And uh, this is what we came up with. Uh, originally we had uh, on October 9th and March 12th, we had um, professional development days where there were, was no school for students, but teachers came. Um, and those were all day professional development experiences. And we really felt like we needed to um, move those to the beginning of the year and have um, instead of just uh, three days of professional development and opportunities for teachers to plan and work in their rooms um, to have the whole week. Uh, we knew that we were going to need many changes, uh, many trainings, um, some of them um, to deal with technology, some of them to deal with um, disinfecting and sanitizing and procedures in the, the different schools um, based on um, what's happening at the time. So we changed those two professional development days um, to have a full week of professional development from the 28th to the, uh, from the 24th to the 28th of August. Um, this created two extra days for teachers in their contracts. Um, so we took the days, um, we added uh, vacation days on December 21st and 27th, 22nd, giving um, our schools a rest for a complete two weeks and um, our custodians and maintenance people would have time to get really get into the schools and make any changes and um, uh, do deep cleanings. Um, so we extended the Christmas or uh, the uh, winter December vacation um, to those two extra days. We also um, had some, um, I believe it was six uh, PD, what we call PD Wednesdays, where we had changed the calendar a bit this year so that the um, PD Wednesdays were um, a full half day. And we just, we, we moved to those, um, we, to Fridays, uh, because as you'll hear later in our plans, um, we didn't want to interrupt students who would be going to school um, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, and possibly half a day on Friday. Um, so we moved all of those um, PD Wednesdays to PD Fridays and kind of spread them out evenly throughout the year. Um, so we had many discussions on this, and uh, this is, was the recommendation from both A-Team and from um, the District Planning Committee. Okay. 
Um, can I have comments from school board members first? Or questions that you might have? Okay, and Nasser? Yeah, is it too late to add other holidays on this or no? We don't actually, well, we have, um, we have national holidays, but we don't have any other holidays in here. So um, because the space is so small, um, I think if you look at that Nasser, it's only the national holidays um, that are in here. So there are no religious holidays written uh, but, right into this. To Nasser's point, I think that if you look mm -hmm. at the district calendar, which is different from this calendar, which is really you, the uh, district calendar is used for scheduling events and that sort of thing. Um, we typically do have major world religious holidays on that calendar. And I think, you know, we just want to make sure we, we do. I do need to say too that um, Jason uh, is in the process of talking with his kindergarten staff and um, right now um, the first day of kindergarten is slated for um, September 3rd. Um, you know, typically we have the kindergarten students come in and do screenings that first week and meet the teacher and those things. So he did want to try to plan um, with them, uh, something like that. So that third, um, September 3rd for the first day of K may be shifting, um, just to put that out there. They have not made the plans for that yet, so. Okay. Okay. Um, are there, comments from the public. I think actually if you raise your hand, not physically, but on Zoom, I think you jump to the top of the list and I see that hand raised and I can call on you. Um, so if you would like to raise your hand and comment. And Heather, this is Phil while you're waiting to see if anyone, yes. a, a public member wants to comment. I just, just to clarify, it does, looks like the same number of, of student days here 175 yeah. yeah so there was just a movement a bit from the beginning to the because of the the uh winter holiday correct okay yeah thank you and i think something that i would like to comment is that um it, it may seem like a long december holiday but we have had that length of a december holiday before so it's not unusual um it, it has happened mm -hmm. um and it might be a nice break for like a two-week chunk to um, deal with things if need be. Um, okay, so I am not seeing any hands raised and I'm not hearing any comments. So I think we will go ahead with the vote. Um, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr? How do we raise hands? We raise hands. Yay. Phil Saucier? Yay. Elizabeth Seifries? Yay. Nasser Shear? Yay. Hope Straw? Yay. And Laura Danino? Yay. Okay. Um, before we move on, I just, this technology, I just want to be clear because I want everybody to feel like there's, they're heard. Uh, there was a question, how do we raise the hands? There's a button in the participants window, go into reactions at the bottom of your screen. There's a reactions button to click at the bottom. So Laura, I know we just voted and I apologize about that. Would you like to still speak? It says that you have a comment under group chat. So me, Lauren Tarantino? Yes. 
Yes, um, I do. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was trying to figure out how to do it. Um, my okay. comment is just about um, aligning our, and I, I think this will probably come up later, but um, aligning our school days with neighboring districts. Um, for those of us that have children that attend school in other districts. Um, so to, I know that other school districts are not having students on Wednesdays. Um, and so hearing that um, that's going to be, I, I didn't know that that would be coming up so early with the calendar, but I just wanted to put that out there um, as something that I think could be important to talk about. Thank you for that comment. Um, Donna, do you wanna speak to that? Because I know we've had conversations around that and you have been speaking with other superintendents in other districts. Um, I, I meet with the Cumberland County superintendents every Wednesday afternoon and um, South Portland, Portland and Falmouth are going with Wednesdays. We first agreed that everyone would go with Friday and then um, they kind of veered off, but um, I believe everybody else in the area is going with Fridays. So, um, so there are some other districts that are going with Fridays. So I, I think um, in the ideal world, it would be nice if every district had the same calendar, but I, I think we're as close as we can be. Is that correct, Donna? Having had conversations and trying we, to align? We, we tried. But we'll talk yeah. more about that when I get into the, the plan. Okay. Okay, so uh, next agenda item B, may I have a motion? And again, please just speak up the board member. I move we approve the plan for fall reopening of school. I have a second. Second, it's Laura. Thank you, Laura. Yep, I can see you. Um, and so discussion, I think this is all you, Donna, yes? Okay, I'm here I go, trying to share my screen again. Bear with me. if this works yes got it okay um here we go so i just want to start by saying that you know we really want to get our students and staff back to school but we know that we need to get them back to school safely. And those are our two priorities, getting students and staff back to school and getting them back to school safely. So every group that has worked on this plan has had these two concerns at the top of our list. If we could bring everyone back, knowing that we're following all the guidelines for safety, we would do that. But we don't have the space, and even if we did have the funding to double our staff, we don't have the capacity to hire all those people at this point, and there would likely not be enough certified teachers available. Um, and just so everyone knows, I've had many um, suggestions about putting aids in classrooms, and we do, we're still working under the uh, teacher certification statutes. So um, we, we do need to teach our students with certified teachers. We've brainstormed and discussed so many possibilities and have made decisions based on whether they can work in our schools based on the opinions, knowledge, and research of the experts who know our students, who know our buildings, and who know our staff. I hope that uh, through this presentation, I can address some of your many questions, but there, at this time, we are still very much in the planning stages, and we don't have all the answers. Um, we do know that we need to be flexible as we address our many needs. So, let me see if I can get this into presentation mode. Okay. Okay, everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Move the people aside here. Um, on July 21st, 2020, we were given guidance from the Department of Education in their framework for returning to classroom discussion. 
This leveling system is based on a red, yellow, and green categorization. Assignment to the various levels will be provided by the Maine Department of Education and the Maine CDC based on scientific data regarding the spread of COVID-19 by county. We expect the first day to be, to be released to us on July 31st. So they have categories categorized red, suggesting that the county has a high risk of COVID-19 spread and that in-person instruction should not be conducted. Categorization as yellow suggests that the county has an elevated risk of COVID-19 spread and the hybrid instruction model should be adopted. And categorization as green suggests that the county has a relatively low COVID-19 risk and that in-person instruction can be adopted. Although an SAU school administrative unit may opt for hybrid instruction if its buildings or readiness make adhering to the required safety, health and safety measures for all schools a challenge. So that's what we were given by the state. And why can't I, whoops. Sorry about this. Oh, it just went to the end. All right, here we go. Another item of guidance from the state is that we offer uh, students and families the option to choose uh, remote learning for an agreed upon period of time. Uh, we received common expectations for hybrid and remote learning models, recommending that we develop three plans for the fall. Returning to in-person instruction with health and safety guidelines in place for all students where there was low risk of COVID-19. And then the second one is a hybrid instruction plan. And the third uh, plan that they suggest that we have is a remote learning plan. An explanation of the goal for a hybrid model is to reduce the numbers of students and staff in one place at the same time when there is moderate risk of transmission of COVID-19. The goal of a fully remote plan is to mitigate the impact when community health metrics indicate a high level of risk. So we will um, be offering um, assuming that we are going into the yellow, which that's just an assumption at this point. Um, but if we were in yellow, would we, we would be offering a remote learning situation for an agreed upon period of time in order to meet the needs of high risk families and students. We would be offering families this option for at least the first semester. And then we would reevaluate our situation and um, move forward from there. It would be necessary to commit to a fall semester of remote learning in order to determine the number of staff needed and to match students and teachers. And we are in the process of working on that right now. Here we go again, it's not moving. Oh, there we go. It is jumping all over. I am really sorry about this. I'm supposed to do this. I'm going to move this up here and see if I can make it go. No, it's not going to go. Okay, I'm just going to go to the slide. So, um, talking about the work that's been done. Here we go. Uh, the, the timeline of the work that's been done to date. So, in May, and um, st this continues, um, the Cape Elizabeth School District administrative team um, has gone through an examination of student needs and family needs and teacher needs. 
uh, Maine CDC guidelines, Maine DOE guidelines, and developed a uh, draft district plan. On, from June 26th to July 16th, six meetings of the district planning team were held to review the calendar um, changes and the suggested dra draft district plan, which is above, um, to discuss and develop district procedures as recommended recommendations to the school board, including methods of communication to staff and family. Those, um, those meetings were uh, videotaped and were posted. I know that many of you watched them and that was great to hear your comments on those. The first meeting was an hour long and the, the other five meetings were each an hour and a half long. So they were, um, they were deep meetings with lots of work being done by everything, everybody. And then um, uh, here we are to July 28th and um, with the school board meeting to review the recommendations. So this is the work that each of those teams did. The administrative teams researched possible scenarios and plans to determine what was doable in their departments, schools, and areas. We examined the needs of students, staff, and parents, the guidelines and recommendations, and the capacity of the district to meet the guidelines. Then we took the calendar and the plans for the three levels. Um, to the district planning team, and there was lots of discussion about that, as some of you watched. Uh, decisions were made for district protocols. We talked about screenings, we talked about mask wearing, um, many things. And we also examined, we examined directives from the state. Um, now we're in the process of school staff meeting, and they are working on school plans, as well as uh, the nutrition staff is meeting. Technology teams are meeting and transportation and maintenance uh, are meeting. So everybody's working on their own individual areas at this point. Um, the A team continues to meet uh, at least once a week to share plans so far and discuss um, needs and um, next steps. So I, what I found out, it just takes a while to go to the next slide. So the, um, the district planning team did uh, develop a recommendation, which I would love to read to you. And here's the recommendation. The district planning team and the Cape Elizabeth administrative team recommend the following pandemic plan for reopening schools to the Cape Elizabeth School Board. This plan complies with the CD, M, uh, main CDC and MDOE guidelines and recommendations and may move from color to color based on data released by the Maine Department of Education and the CDC. School planning teams will develop detailed plans within this framework for their schools. The employee handbook and the parent student handbook will be revised as needed based on changes in Maine CDC and Maine Department of Education guidelines. And we're working on those guidelines at this point. I'm trying to get it to go to the next slide. All right, I'm gonna go back and start, sorry.
Okay, we're gonna try it this way. See if I can, no, I can't get it to move that way either. There we go. Well, this I think this is good, good as it gets, so we'll go this way. Um, so um, this is something that the district planning team works on. I have rearranged the colors so that they can coincide with the state um, document that I showed you earlier with the red first, then the yellow, and then the green. So the level red um, would result in 100% of our students learning remotely with the implementation of a remote learning schedule by each of the schools. There would be a consistent set of expectations regarding instruction, support, grading, and attendance throughout the district, with variations based on the developmental level of students at different grades. The level yellow would be the hybrid model, which would be a combination of in-school and remote learning with CDC guidelines implemented. And we know that the CDC guidelines, main CDC guidelines, um, often change. Right now, we are working on plans for a maroon gold schedule with maroon consistently attending school on my, maroon students uh, on Mondays and Wednesdays. And uh, students who are in the gold would be attending school on Tuesdays and Thursdays with gold and maroon attending every other Friday morning. Um, that would leave teachers with having meeting and planning time on Friday afternoons in order to promote consistency on instruction within departments and grade levels. Uh, based on the direction from the state, we may at any time need to alter the configuration of the hybrid model to meet state and uh, main CDC guidelines. So this is what we're looking at right now for a hybrid model, but we do know that we're getting new information on the 31st, which is later this week, and we will get new data every two weeks. Um, we have to start somewhere with our planning, so we are really right now planning on starting in this model, in the yellow, with this model. Again, the yellow model could change depending on direction from the state, but it still would be a combination of remote uh, and in-school learning. Uh, Principals continue to work on the creation of the maroon and gold group. So a little information about this. Uh, I did get some questions about how the groups were formatted. We started by looking at last names of students within a family, knowing that all, all students in the family do not have the same last name. So that was a, a bit tricky. Um, we're trying to make this, um, by having st all students in the same family attend school on the same day, we thought that might be easier on families. Uh, then the principals looked at the groups when they divided them and um, used, especially at the elementary and the middle school level, the many other factors that they use every year when developing class lists, uh, such as creating a balance in gender, a balance in needs, and a balance in ability levels. They also looked at teacher comments and uh, recommendations and took those into consideration. So uh, this was a... Uh, a Monmouth task, but the lists are almost complete. Um, I met with the principals today and they want to check and recheck the lists, um, but when they're satisfied with their accuracy, then they will um, release the information. I believe it'll be distributed through PowerSchool. So we're hoping for the end of next week, but that is not written in stone at this point. That's just an es estimation. There will be, as you can see at the bottom of the yellow um, model, a remote learning option. And as I said, we are working on that right now, trying to match um, high risk, uh, people with high risk situations um, who should not be in, in classrooms um, because of their high risk situations and students um, who wish to continue in the hybrid model. So again, this option will be offered on a semester by semester basis, and we will reevaluate at the end of um, every semester. We need to organize it in a semester by semester basis in order to match the number of students with the number of teachers. Um, in the hybrid model, um, I know I've had some suggestions and some lovely pictures about um, students learning outside. And certainly in the hybrid model, the teachers would be free to take their students outside for learning. 
um, maintaining social distancing and mask wearing, weather permitting. Um, but we do live in Maine and we know that um, towards the end of October it gets a little cold outside. And um, so to plan for all year round outdoor um, experiences um, probably wouldn't work for us um, <laughs> as it gets colder and colder. Again, we are moving forward, hopefully, with the plans to start in the hybrid model. However, this plan could change based on changes in data from now and until the start of school. We could end up the day before school starts having the CDC tell us that we're in the red zone and we have to go to remote learning. So um, our principals and administrators are totally aware of that and we are making plans for um, all the various um, plans. Uh, the green level would have 100% for our students in school under Maine CDC and Maine DOE guidelines. We've studied this model and tried to think every which way how we could do this. Um, but um, really, we think at this point, um, having all of 100% of our students in school, we would not be able to follow the guidelines and it would not be a safe situation for our students. The second green level would be implemented should a vaccine be discovered and the main CDC and main DOE direct us to remo remove the guidelines made necessary by COVID-19. Um, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Uh, the framework for returning to classroom instruction from the DOE outlines, let's see, here we go, outlines the um, health and safety measures that schools need to meet at all risk levels. So we have been um, developing strategies to meet these measures. The first one that there's been a lot of talk about is the symptom screening before coming to school. And up until I believe the end of last week, um, we were under guidelines that said that, um, that we needed to screen students. Um, now the guidelines have changed and the most recent version of the main CDC frameworks require students to symptom screen before coming to school. So that would be before coming to school, before getting on the bus. Um, in the usual packet of materials that are provided at the beginning of school to parents through Power School, uh, there will be a parent contract um, that outlines the cooperation that we need from families. And we really need cooperation from families in, in uh, providing a safe environment for our students. Um, the document will need to be signed before the students return to school in the fall. So um, we will be administrators um, will be and nurses will be checking um, power school to make sure those documents are signed and um, The document one of the things that it says is that you will do screenings at home and that students will use uh, will wear masks at school The screener Here, and here are some of the questions. Um, the screener will consist of several questions that parents and students need to answer before they come to school each day. Staff will also be required to self-assess daily. So we know that there's many apps out there and there's some Google Forms um, that communicate with the school. We're still researching, um, since we just heard about this change um, this week, really, the end of last week, we're still researching we're looking at apps, we're looking at um, some forms um, that will communicate with the school about self-assessments that are done before the, the students get to school. There will be a student, uh, a person at the school that checks the data daily um, to make sure that everyone has completed their screening before they arrive. And if the screening has not been completed, um, we will be calling families about that. So we're really, um, we really, this is really a cooperative venture with, with our families. We're really counting on our families um, to do this screening. Uh, there have been a lot of questions about physical distancing and facilities. And again, um, these are required health and uh, safety measures um, that are in our uh, frameworks. So again, this is something that just changed. Uh, it was always six feet distancing. Now it's three feet distancing with masks. Um, however, 
uh, the requirement is still six feet distancing for eating, um, which um, we could uh, have more students in our classrooms if uh, we went to the three feet distancing. However, um, and I think I'll get into this a bit later, um, our challenge um, is a uh, feeding our students, especially if anybody's been in the Pond Cove Middle School cafeteria, you know that there's many, many students in there um, and we have many lunch periods. Um, I think if we did, if we tried to do six feet um, of distancing, uh, the required six feet for social distancing for eating, we would be sort of having students eat all day. Um, we have been talking all along about keeping students in their little groups and having them eat in, in their classrooms. And that is the plan that we'll move forward with. Our challenge now is how to provide coverage for students in their classrooms while eating, um, while teachers are able to take their contracted 30 minutes of duty-free lunch. So that is what the principals are working on at this point. We also, the social distancing requirement for buses has changed and it's now three feet. So we will be able to accommodate more students on our bus and um, Pat Fowler is um, in the process of working on that puzzle. Uh, so that will alleviate our busing issue a bit. Uh, we will most likely hire a monitor to sit on each bus to make sure that the social distancing and the masks are worn um, on the buses. So um, we are working on that. Um, masks and face coverings must be worn by students and employees at all time, including on the bus, except when eating or uh, when employees are in rooms by themselves. So there may be times when students are elsewhere and employees are um, in their rooms um, planning or um, doing something by themselves. So uh, that would not require a mask. Hand hygiene and protocols will be followed and our nurses are working on that. And um, students and staff will be receiving training. That's one of the trainings um, that will be um, done on one of those first uh, days in August when staff are, are uh, will be done virtually. Um, all, the, all of our, that whole week, by the way, will be done virtually. Um, uh, extra sanit hand sanitation um, stations will be set up throughout the school. So I know Perry is working on that, on that at, at this point. Um, additional safety precautions uh, are required for nurses and staff supporting students in close proximity. Oops, that would be eye protection, EYE. Um, face shields, um, the like, and um, we're working on ordering that um, equipment at this point. And then the last um, health and safety measure is the return to school after illnesses, uh, after illness and um, students would be home until the criteria for their return would be met. And we will have that all outlined in the parent uh, student handbook. Okay, this has been a question responding to in school cases of COVID 19, and we do have a process for that. Um, we are expecting, uh, there will be, an, uh, nurses will have two, basically two rooms. Um, we're going to identify an isolations room for any students that we suspect or are showing symptoms of COVID. Parents will be expected to pick up six students within 30 minutes. And um, we, we are asking parents if they can't, if they're working farther away than 30 minutes and can't get to school in 30 minutes, that they let us know 
uh, the names of um, some emergency people that can pick their students up and bring them home within 30 minutes. I'm very concerned about um, not spreading germs and not having six students in our schools any longer than we have to. Um, notify health officials, parents, and staff immediately of a positive case while maintaining confidentially confidentiality and privacy laws. So we cannot give, and we found that out in the spring, we can't give out specific information um, about names or grades or, or um, things like that. Following Maine CDC advice for the return of, of the person uh, who tested positive, and uh, Maine CDC is giving that advice. Um, if you are identified with a positive test, um, you, you will be contacted by CDC and they will advise you about what to do. Uh, we will advise those who have con a contact with the person to stay home and monitor for symptoms following Maine CDC guidelines. And if a person tests positive but not, does not have symptoms, they also will need to follow Maine CDC guidelines for home uh, isolation. Additional considerations and recommendations which are within the framework. <laughs> we need to assess school readiness, which we have been doing. Um, we've been using the CDC flow chart and the, um, the considerations for opening schools are, there are three. Will reopening be consistent with applicable state and local orders? Is the school ready to protect children and employees at higher risk for severe illness? So that's what we're working on. One of the things we're working on right now. And are you able to screen students and employees? Now this is where it's changed upon arrival and it's no longer upon arrival. It is now um, they, at home before arrival to school. So we are constantly assessing our readiness uh, for the opening of school, identifying the next area we need to address as we put these plans in place, we'll be constantly reassessing to determine what's working and what we need to change. Um, number two, disinfecting facilities. Our, our custodial staff has been developing plans to uh, disinfect our facilities, and we have been directed by the state to remove all unnecessary furniture, toys, and other items from our classroom in order to make disinfecting uh, easier as we work to provide a germ-free environment for our students and staff. Um, so that is something that um, not only do we have to remove the unnecessary furniture, and some of those things belong to teachers, so we're going to ask our teachers to be taking home their things um, that might fall under those categories, but extra, if we have extra desks, um, extra furniture, um, then we are making plans on where to store that. <laughs> so that's another area that we need to think about. Disinfecting high touch areas, and we worked on that as we were closing out school last year. Uh, high, high touch areas such as doorknobs, copying machines, faucets, dis and plans are in the works to disinfect them frequently. Um, we will be marking six foot distancing in hallways uh, outside of bathrooms and in areas where students line up and be, we will be marking one-way directions in the hallway similar to um, what they do in the grocery stores. Uh, this is going to be a challenge in some of our schools and it may be um, that hallways are divided in half um, with going down one side and back up the other because some of our hallways really don't have um, the capacity to um, have a two and a from like the grocery stores do. Um, we talked in the district planning meeting a bit about providing, providing communication to parents and staff and that will remain through our Facebook page and our power school blasts and always on our website. So I am constantly reminding people to check those those places. Um, staff, we felt like the email system was adequate and um, I was asked to um, send out uh, texts uh, to people if it was something, an emergency that they needed to look at their email. 
We are working on our staff trainings for that first week and those will continue, um, I imagine, throughout the year as we look at those um, now PD Fridays. Uh, the nurses have done some work on providing training to families. They've located some videos that um, are, they are posting. Um, our tech people are working on some trainings. I think some of them will be um, virtual, sort of as much in person as we can get at this point. But um, they will be, be providing some training on some of the technology that we're, that we're using. And communicating expectations to family and staff about self-assessment. So again, that's the, that's the uh, self-screening that is needed to be done um, before students come to school every day. So we actually started working on this today, thanks to uh, the leadership of our Director of Special Services, Del Pieve. Um, he's going to work with um, school counselors, social workers, and some special service providers. And they'll be meeting, I just saw that he put out a, a meeting uh, for them uh, today. So they will be meeting to develop plans to address the social, emotional, behavior, and mental health needs of our students as we return to school during this stressful time. And we know that um, students as well as staff are, are, are and will be stressed. We've gone through some interesting times. Um, this team will develop plans to offer and to provide support to students and families in need, uh, to provide frequent check-ins with staff, families, and students, and they'll make a list of available resources for students and parents who are experiencing distress. So um, they, will, they will be starting the work on that very soon. School teams have already started working to develop instructional plans for various learning models within their schools. Um, they'll be addressing instructional strategies, grading, assessments, and student support, as well as many other things. Um, there are plans. We have our advisory group at the middle at the high school, and I know that Troy and Kyle are working, and the and the teachers there are working on developing an advisory group uh, advisory system at the middle school. Um, so we have those advisors that will be meeting um, often with their advisory groups ready to support students who are struggling or experiencing um, needs. Teams of teachers will continue to meet to review students experiencing learning loss and to arrange for uh, available support. So there are lots of, um, of plans in the works, lots of planning being done at this point on the academic programs and um, supports for student learning. We do have some common expectations. I know that um, it, one of the, or some of the comments that we received when we did the emergency remote learning um, survey um, was that um, we needed common expectations. So we are working on uh, within the schools and within the district on creating common expectations for both the hybrid and the remote learning models. And that will be um, agreed upon course or grade level learning targets. So talking, um, teams are meeting to talk about where, where do students need to be at this point in the year? What are the uh, expectations for, uh, for their learning targets uh, for uh, small amounts of time? And setting up schedules for learning. We need to work on um, certifying student attendance each day. We are required to do that by the state. So we will be working on a plan for that. Um, Accepted and consistent teaching platforms, coordination of workloads when students have different teachers for different schedules, and the multi-tiered system of supports for meeting students' needs. Groups of teachers are working on, are and will be working on all of those things between now and when school starts, and it will continue after school starts as well. Uh, our plan for grading and for certifying achievement, a plan for providing student nutrition, Peter Esposito, our Director of Student Services, has, um, has done a great job with, from the very beginning, providing 
uh, food for families and students, and he will continue doing that. Um, it will be um, an added um, step with having some students in the class and some students at home. So that, that will be interesting for him. I know that he is uh, planning on when students are in school, uh, serving in the classrooms and they will be um, individually wrapped lunches with disposable um, silverware um, in order to try to prevent the spread of germs. And communication with families to assist in understanding um, expectations, who to contact and where to get help when necessary. So we are working on a flow chart that will help and that will be in the um, student parent handbook, parent student handbook. Um, who to contact if you have an issue with something. Maybe if your technology is not working, who to contact. If you're not understanding um, uh, one of the assignments, who to contact. Um, just a flow chart on who to contact if, you, um, if you're having an issue with something. We want, we want people to, um, to be able to get the help they need. That's very important. Additional considerations. Our nurses are going to be very busy as we enter the new school year. And, but, you know, they have been working all summer. They've been very busy all summer working on um, procedures and plans and keeping up with um, main CDC guidelines. Um, you know, aaron has been on the state committee. Um, they've been attending meetings uh, virtually. So they have been extremely busy all summer. Um, they will be triaging and monitoring. monitoring very busy as we've entered the new school year and but you know they have been working all summer they've been very busy all summer working on it are you hearing that the plans and keeping up with um, yeah, and technology <laughs> state committee yeah, i don't know what that is donna that sounds like a like a little reaction from you yeah i think it's that people have to mute and it's we're hearing feedback from someone's machine. Yeah, somebody must be on like the Facebook Live I'm because there's the page. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. everybody should be on mute except for Donna. Thank you. Please. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I figured that was the Facebook page. Yeah. <laughs> oh anyway. Um, so they're going to be uh, triaging and monitoring students who are displaying symptoms and making determinations based on standard protocols and main CDC guidelines. So we are looking to maybe main CDC guidelines for our guidance at this point and our framework. Transportation has been an interesting issue as we divide students into maroon and gold groups and identify students who wish to continue with remote learning for the semester. And as we review our survey of parents who expressed um, interest in transporting their own students, Pat Fowler will be taking these puzzle pieces and using them to create a bus schedule. So I'm, I just wanna put this out there to parents. If um, we, we had your names with those surveys, so we're going by that, but if your situation changes during the summer, would you please let Pat know so she can either add you to the bus schedule or take you off the bus schedule. Um, she will be in arranging bus routes in order to ensure the required social distancing. Bus assignments will be made and only those assigned students will be um, admitted to the buses. So we're, we're going to be very strict about that because we have to follow the social distancing guidelines and the, bus, the buses will be set up um, according to those guidelines for social distancing. Students needing bus transportation should be picked up at the same bus stop every day and they have to be dropped off at the same bus stop every day. I know in the past we've tried to be really um, helpful about maybe somebody needs to go this place on Tuesday and then this place on Wednesday and a different place on Friday. And um, because of our social distancing requirements, we really have to be mindful of who is assigned to what bus. Um, so it's okay if they are picked up at one spot and dropped off at the, the other spot. And we know that ahead of time, but it has to be consistent. Um, it, can't, it can't change from day to day. Um, so that's, I know that's going to be really hard for some people, but it's the way we have to do it in order to ensure social distancing and to ensure the safety of all the students on the bus. Many parents answered that they would be driving their students to school. 
So that was great, except we know that this is going to cause a traffic issue in town with citizens trying to get to work and any of you who have been caught in just um, the traffic jam of trying to get our student, drop our students off or uh, trying to get to work in the, um, in the area um, know that there's quite a traffic jam that usually starts about quarter of eight. And if you get stuck in that, it's, uh, it's difficult. So we are going to be talking with um, Chief Chief of Police Fenton as we look further into the traffic challenges. One of the things we have talked about is assigning different drop-off points throughout the campus and we will look um, into that further. Um, but we know that, that this is going to cause a traffic jam in town and we'll try to work to do the best we can with that to alleviate that situation. I would advise anybody who can drive around town to get to work to do that. So we, we are going to put out some additional guidance. Um, the employee handbook, the draft, um, is on our supporting documents page for tonight's meeting. I don't, um, we just got that up this afternoon, but you might wanna take a look at that. It is a draft. And as, um, as CDC, Maine CDC and Maine DOE guidelines change, that will be re revised as well. Um, and we are working, um, um, Jill Young has done a lot of work on the parent student handbook. Um, there will be links for each school to put specific school information. So we are, we are working on that. So with that, I'd like to give the principals an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the planning that they have done. Um, we just really finished uh, the end of June with our, um, sorry, mid-July with our district planning team meetings. Um, and so then the plan was for them to take them back to their school uh, teams to start to work. So they're just really, um, some of them uh, got a head start on that. But um, let's start with Jeff Shedd at the high school. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about what's going on with your planning? This is all very drafty at this point and subject to change. Sure, well, um, I've got a team of 11 staff members who have met, I think we've met five times, um, and the committee is two administrators, Nate Carpenter and myself, and then nine other staff members, including teachers and ed techs. Um, at our first meeting, we made some decisions about thinking about um, areas of the building or circumstances the building that could create bottlenecks and traffic tie-ups between adults in the building. Um, so we agreed that we would be holding meetings for the foreseeable future until we're confident that it's safe. Adult meetings online so that they would be virtual. Um, we have talked about closing the faculty lunchroom for use for that purpose because that's another space where there's there is frequent contact between adults um, we will be delivering mail to teachers so they're not having to come into the cramped quarters of the main office um, and we are going to be relocating one of the copier machines in the main office to try to spread out use of copier machines and also to um, encourage teachers as much as possible <clears throat> not to not to copy as much as we used to one of the things we did learn in remote learning is that we can get by without doing a lot of photocopying. Um, the next three meetings were pretty much dominated by a discussion of the schedule, um, what our school daily school schedule would look like. Um, and as you summarized, Donna, we've talked about, you know, Monday and Wednesday, there's a half of the kids who are in school and Tuesday and Thursday, the other half of the students are in school. Um, it's not strictly alphabetical as, as you discussed. Um, and then we talked about essentially how to divide up the time blocks. Uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, we have in the high school an eight period schedule um, in normal times. We will continue to have an eight period schedule, but um, after several meetings with committee, particularly the last committee meeting, we sort of stepped back and said, what are the criteria that we're gonna be using to judge uh, which schedule would be the best that suits our purposes? And we listed a whole bunch of criteria and then in small groups, we prioritized them and then we shared those in a larger group. 
And there was a really strong consensus around several top criteria in terms of identifying a school schedule. And the first one was, and, and everybody's list was safety and health. Um, so that really sort of pointed us in the direction of minimizing as much as possible um, students passing uh, in the high school, given the nature of our schedule, we can't, it really doesn't work in the high school to do pods of students who are in one location all day because kids are, they, they're mixed up in different classes and that sort of things. But what we decided is we needed a schedule that would minimize uh, to the extent we could uh, passing from one classroom to another. Um, a second one that there was a strong consensus about was adaptability that whatever, because we are going to face the situation where one week we may be in remote learning and then we may have to go into hybrid learning and then three weeks later we may be able to go into live learning. We decided a really important consideration was adaptability, that we should have a schedule uh, that we can, with very minor tweaks, adapt to any of those situations um, which, quite frankly, pushed us away from our relatively complex normal day-to-day -day schedule at the high school, which is a rotating schedule in the morning and the afternoons. Uh, we talked about simplicity and manageability for teachers and students as a really top consideration. And probably the next one that was among the top in all the groups was whatever we do that needs to be able to work with kids who cannot come to the high school for whatever reason because of their health risks and, and those sorts of things. So what we have settled on is what we're referring to as a shorter block schedule. Uh, it's not completely set in stone as few things seem to be, but we have, a, uh, I think, a strong belief that um, the original idea was um, on Mondays, which would be a maroon Monday, the maroon kids would be there and our, we would have four of our eight periods meet. On Tuesday, uh, we would have the next group of kids in school and the other four periods would meet. And on Wednesday, we would have, again, the, another group of kids. And, and, and so basically what would happen is that every day, four periods would meet, half the kids would be in school at any one time. Um, and, and the way it works out, the way it would work out in that situation is that each kid would, each student would be with each um, half of this, the students in their classes one time per week. Uh, we've since had some further discussions based on a recommendation from a teacher and in part inspired by some thinking that's coming from South Portland High School about basically sticking with that model in the big picture sense, but instead of alternating the periods that meet during the days, have the same periods meet for a period of either four weeks or eight weeks. And then the next period to meet for four weeks or eight weeks. The advantage of that is it would allow teachers to meet with their students live twice per week. Some I know, some people who are listening to this can visualize this. For some people it's boggling their minds, but it's basically a, the other reason we, so there were two reasons we're talking about either a four week or eight week alternating block essentially. Um, still in that system, half the kids would be in the building one day, then the other half kids in the building the next day, and then that would just keep rotating. But the other reason to do that, it, was, it would actually minimize the number of kids who are passing through our classrooms in any, on any given day. Um, so it would essentially cut the potential number in half or in any given week uh, because we'd have just a certain number of students being in the building for an extended period of time. Um, so that's where we are. Our last meeting, we started talking about things like masks and ventilation issues has been a big discussion in terms of keeping our classroom doors open. We've had discussions about do, keeping windows open that presents some issues depending on where a particular classroom is located and noises that can be coming from outside. Uh, we've had discussions about keeping the exterior um, uh, doors of the building open. We haven't settled on anything around that because that presents some issues as well. Um, we've talked about bringing fans into classrooms to increase ventilation, which is a huge thing. Um, and the last meeting, we also started talking about student lockers and students' access to lockers because those are other areas where students can come together. 
And our strong inclination would be not to have students use lockers, particularly if we have only students who are only responsible for four periods a day when they're in school. So that reduces the number of classes, materials they need to carry around with them. Obviously, when the weather gets cold, they need some place to put their, their, their suits, their jackets. Um, so, so we haven't sort of settled that. Sort of next up on the list of things we need to talk about is lunch, as you suggested, and, and in the high school study hall. Um, so that will be a, those will be topics among others at our next meeting. Um, so that's in a nutshell what we have in mind. Okay, so are we going, Donna, through all the principles? Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't see I don't Troy know. on the... I'm oh. here. Okay. Right. okay. Go ahead, Troy. Would you like Hi. to speak, Troy? Sure. So um, I think we've basically done a lot of the things Jeff's done, so I will save some of that time. Um, some of the work Jeff and his group has done around bottlenecks and staff precautions, I think, is awesome. And it, and I think we're just going to steal it all from him because it sounds like it makes perfect sense. Um, but largely at the middle school, our, diff our schedule is always slightly different from the high school anyways. We are basically much more of a traditional um, seven periods in a day. So right now, our goal, much like Jeff's, is always first student safety, student staff. How can we ensure that? And to do that, it's really about um, following CDC guidelines and, you know, we've really gotten into the potting idea of how, how do we create the smallest groups of, of students um, per day that we can and limit the, the transitions that they have in the interactions with other adults. Um, so there are some necessary transitions, but, but by nature, our fifth and sixth grade has always been kind of two person teams. Um, so that works out really nicely. Pre COVID, we were beginning to start to work on um, seventh and eighth really becoming uh, more content based. So our schedule was kind of pre-designed for that. We have since had a lot of conversations individually with seventh grade teachers, with eighth grade teachers, and we've made the decision to go with the two-person teaming model for seventh and eighth grade as well. And the goal is to limit the number of students um, per team. And, and right now it looks like we're in that around the 35 student ballpark. And we can do that with just some tweaks to our schedule. So I think that's pretty good. Um, much like Jeff said, we were, we also, it's really important to us in looking at the survey data from parents, you know, from last spring, that whatever we do, it should be very flexible and, and it really needs to be able to work across the different models. So our regular traditional kind of school schedule, now that it's been tweaked and there's still a few tweaks to do to it, um, will work for teaming across our building. It will also work in a hybrid model and it will also work for remote learning. So uh, I think with just a, a few tweaks here and there, that's going to be, that'll be very helpful for us. So that's really one, one pretty big goal that we have. Um, we have met today for the first time with our building based committee. I think we had about 22 people there. Um, and the discussion was really an update to where we are. And Jill gave us a, a great, health and safety update because I think that's the leading question that we all have is what are the guidelines how are we going to follow them because those have to be in place before we can build our designs our schedules and our you know our hallways and how do we walk through them and, and all of those things and, and we're also thinking of having students enter the building at multiple locations because it's probably there's a good chance it's going to be kind of a rolling start to every day and a rolling end due to the busing and some of the restrictions that we have so to, in order to kind of make that a, a as efficient as we can, things like that are gonna be, will be a change. Um, we are implementing the advisor program again. And right now through our team leaders, we've identified what are the roles and responsibilities of an advisor? What, what would a parent or a student go to an advisor for? And what, for example, might they go to power school for? And we're working on creating some consistent expectations around Google Classroom. So, because it's very hard to navigate a couple of Google Classrooms say nothing about seven, eight, nine of them. And that was a lot of feedback from parents and from 
teachers in the building that may have to work with other class, classroom teachers. So uh, taking a lot of the information off the survey and trying to put it to use and work out some, some nice solutions. We already had a win period, kind of like Jeff was talking about his study hall. But the idea behind win typically is that if a student needs help from another teacher, they can go see that teacher. Obviously, that's not going to be an effective model right now in trying to limit the, the transitions for students. So that really is probably going to look much more like an advisor kind of period um, where, where a lot of that work can be done. So we're in the process right now of trying to align our advisor groups with those win periods um, and work through that, that whole process. So largely, that's kind of where we are right now. And we know that a lot of stuff is going to continue to change. We did have our, I'm really happy to have 22 people volunteer to show up at a meeting today um, in the middle of the summer to talk about that. And we had a wide range of expertise. And so we're breaking that down into about five subgroups um, of high interest that people will be able to work on in small groups. So the large groups are not always meeting. So that's, that is kind of where we are. We feel like we're in a good place. I think that the, we, we could work on this steady for two years and not feel like we're ever probably really ready. But largely, I feel like we are in a great place. We have great people working with us. I, I'm sure that we can, we can do it. Um, so that's kind of where we are. OK, Conco. Everybody hear me OK? Yes. yes. Thank you, Jason. Yes, thanks, Heather. So I, I want to start by thanking the administrative team um, and the teachers who are, are working through the summer and thanking the parents and families for being so flexible and supportive. Um, I've had lots of conversations with um, families, uh, moms and dads over the, the past few months and um, gotten a lot of really great ideas from them and a lot of, of um, really great compliments and, and, some, and some good uh, honest feedback. So thank you all. Uh, much of what I say will be similar to what Troy and Jeff said because we do work so closely together. As Donna said, we meet one or two times a week. Um, we've been doing that all summer long, so we're really in sync with each other. Um, so, you know, at Pond Cove, to, to build off of the work that has been completed by the district committee, uh, we are starting to draft plans um, for the three scenarios, which would be, of course, uh, full remote, uh, hybrid, which is partial remote and, and partial on campus. And also if students all are able to come back um, to campus, which we all hope will happen. Uh, and so we're, um, we've put quite a bit of emphasis on the hybrid model, but we're, we're paying close attention to all three because we, we are not sure where we'll start and we expect to possibly move from one to the other. And we want to be able to do so seamlessly um, if, that, if the time comes. So, um, Right now at Pond Cove, we, um, we, are, we have two committees that have been formed, two separate committees. The first is the curriculum um, planning committee. And so that um, committee uh, has two to three representatives from each grade level. And they're charged with developing a scope and sequence and a, a assessment um, package for either a full remote plan or a hybrid plan. Um, and we know that we'll be starting in a different place than we typically would. So teachers are being asked to think about the fact that although we did offer some great remote teaching, uh, it still wasn't quite the same. And students uh, you know, left campus in March. And so we're gonna be assessing kids very early as we always do, but expecting some different results this year and um, tailoring our instruction to, to meet the student needs. So that committee has been working for a few weeks um, and, and we'll, we're checking in with them and they're sharing, um, they're gonna be sharing um, what they're working on with each other for consistency across grade levels. And we're excited about that work. The second committee is just the, we're calling it the Pond Cove Reopening Committee and it's really about logistics. So um, based on CDC recommendations, um, we're going to be working on those logistics, so schedules, traffic patterns, and as Troy mentioned, we're um, we're really head in, head in the direction of the pods, you know. So we're trying our top priority is safety, and so we are um, making sure or trying to limit the amount of um, adults, stu different adults, students are in contact with, and different students they're in contact with. Um, to be as preventative as possible. 
so we're working on that. Um, and our goal, you know, our goal right now is to get as many kids back into Pond Cove as possible safely. Um, and we want to make a plan for that and get information out to families as soon as we can. We really, we know that um, there's a sense of urgency. Um, you know, most of us are parents as well, and we're all want to know what our students, what their lives will be like in the fall. And we really um, empathize with that and we're working as hard as we can. Um, so thank you families for your patience. So that's really where we're at right now. Um, I'm not sure if there, if, if there's anything else I should add, Donna or Heather or anything I missed. Donna, we can't hear you, just so you know. There you go, you should be okay, Donna. Yes. Uh, we people have been working really hard this summer. There's been a lot of great work that's gone on. It's um, it's difficult work. It's frustrating because we don't have all the information and it could change any moment. But um, everybody's really dug in, and I, I just I too want to thank everybody for all their hard work this summer. It's been they're a great team. Yeah. Um. Okay, I think, does that complete your presentation, Donna? It does. Okay, um, I'm gonna open it up to questions from the school board for a moment. Um, and I did see that there were a few comments, questions in the chat, and I will address those in a moment. Um, but is, is there anything immediate from the school board to ask or comments? that you would like to add before we open it up to the public a little more. Nasser, Hi, are you Nasser. raising your hand? Uh, yeah, I got a question. Uh, okay. I think one of the people uh, is asking a similar question and going in a similar direction. Uh, is going back to school, even if it's hybrid or full-time, an option or is it a must? And if it's one or the other, uh, are we going to have a different uh, health sheets uh, signing up uh, in reference to a student being or being a, um, part or being uh, affected in the school system? So is there a way for school to protect itself or not? Or is there a paperwork like that that's going to be different this year? So, Nazar, are you talking about high risk students? Yeah. Not high risk, just a student getting getting uh, the virus in the guard forbid, either their family or that student uh, passes death wise. So you want, so you're asking about paperwork. How is the school legally protected from a lawsuit? Well, we have found <laughs> out that <laughs> that's a good question. We have found out that. Um, uh, our, um, our insurance company does not cover airborne diseases. So um, the way we're going to protect ourselves is to follow CDC guidelines and main DOE guidelines very, very carefully. There's no additional paperwork from parents to sign that they are now responsible. Uh, there will be a contract that is in that initial um, uh, packet uh, on PowerSchool that parents will sign saying that they, um, they will screen their students, they, their students, they understand that their students will wear masks. Um, nurses, do you wanna chime in? What else is on that contract? And lastly, uh, the other okay. question was, is it a must for a student to attend or they can opt out as well? For Folio, one semester or what? The, the remote learning, uh, the special remote learning would be uh, a sign up for a, a one semester first. At a, one semester at a time. Erin, I see you there. Would you like to speak up? I, I can. I'm trying. I was <laughs> trying to find our um, the draft of the contract just to run right. it through with people. Um, mm -hmm. So we had about six or seven boxes um, that parents would by signing their name on the form would basically be checking off that they have reviewed um, 
So the first one would be that they have read and understood the parent handbook that will be sent home once it's out of draft form. And also um, we're in the process of working on student communication as well. So a slideshow that can be shared with students so that they understand their responsibilities once they are in um, the school building as far as hygiene, social distancing, mask wearing. Um, and then um, the, the contracts, um, the next one is I've read, understand and agree to comply with the expectations of myself and my child. Um, to complete daily symptom checklists honestly and report absences related to these symptoms per building protocol. Um, so that is gonna be hugely important for all families every day to let us know um, through power school or whatever system is in place in their school buildings as to why their child is absent for the day, um, just to help us with monitoring for symptoms, potential outbreaks. Um, and then um, there's a, box for I have plan in place uh, to be able to pick up my child in 30 minutes of being contacted by the school nurse should my child become ill while in school grounds. Um, I agree to follow the guidance and recommendations of the school nurse related to COVID-19 symptoms and the return to school and I understand the school closure could occur at any given time which may result in 100% remote learning. Thank you Erin. Hi, it's Jill Young here, the nurse at the middle school. I just wanted to add, I just wanted to add to um, Erin's comments there on our parent contract. It is in draft form. However, um, a very important piece of that contract is that, you know, all of us as school nurses, our job is to ensure the safety and well-being of our staff and students. Um, and in part doing that, we are also doing that for our community as a whole. And returning back to school mid-pandemic does not allow for that. Um, we will do our very best. Um, and the contract does read that the health and safety of students and employees are the district's top priority. This requires your help and compliance. However, during these uncertain times, the Cape Elizabeth School Department cannot guarantee that your child will not be exposed to COVID-19 while at school. So just being very upfront with that. And that is, um, again, that's draft form, but it would be very similar to that, just stating that um, this is a unique situation and we cannot guarantee and, and ensure your child's well-being as far as um, exposure to the virus. It's very likely that not only will they be exposed, but we could even potentially have an outbreak. It's just the situation that we're in. So it's just acknowledging that. Thank you, Jill. Um, I believe Kimberly was trying to speak as well. Are you there, Kimberly? Do you have a comment? Kimberly Carr? And then Hope, you can speak. I see your hand. Let's give Kimberly a second. Um, Let's give Kimberly a second. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Um, I had a couple of questions. There were some, um, I, I guess Vermont has pushed their um, school start date Back, and I'm wondering if you're hearing anything along those lines um, potentially happening here, Donna. Um, and um, I guess also wondering if there's been any talk of um, if we are in a yellow zone and um, able to start with a hybrid model of um, what is our plan to um, just start right out the gate with the alternating maroon gold days or have a slower pace and see how it goes and ramp up or what is our plan for that? So one of the things, um, so our governor has not come out with anything, nor do I expect. Um, Maine works a little different than Vermont. Um, Vermont's um, very much um, top down from the, they don't call it the DOE, but um, uh, they work very different. They have a very different system than we do. So I, I don't expect anything um, from the governor she never actually tells us when the first day of school is or the governor doesn't. Um, that's something that um, districts um, work on tradition and work on um, work together. Uh, we, we send our students to PAS, so that's another piece of that. And we can only have five dissimilar days, so we have to work within the PAS schedule. Things have changed a little um, this year, but 
Um, I don't expect anything from the governor. We have talked about um, doing some rolling in, uh, maybe that first week of school, having, say, the freshmen come a few days by themselves to the high school. So you may see some information about that, maybe the fifth graders, uh, so they can get used to the new school buildings um, and do some teamwork. So there may be, um, there may be some plans uh, in place for that. Um, and I, as I said, we, we talked about the kindergarten and um, doing their traditional kindergarten entry um, rather than just starting school the first day, but having some time to do some screening. So we're, we're in the midst of making those plans and talking about those things right now. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Hope, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi. Um, so I think tonight I heard we have the we have the um, different phases we can be in. We can be green, yellow, red, yellow, green, and that it will change based on data. And I, I think I heard tonight um, that could change every two weeks, but I, 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 I'm trying to get an idea of like every week we're going to be basically waiting for the data to come out and then we'll know this is what. Can you elaborate on how that will be so we know, you know sort of the cadence of, of how far in the future we have, we know. Uh, uh, this plan was revealed, I think, last week. Um, I don't have a lot of information about it from the DOE, except that they told us that the, we would get our first data on uh, July 31st, and then we would get a different set of scientific data on which to make our decisions um, every two weeks. And that's really all that they gave us. I have no idea when in the day it's coming out or how we're receiving the information. I, I don't know. Thank you. I guess I, I think that's useful for us to sort of have in mind so we can envision that we're likely going to be in a roughly two week adaptability mode and that's what we should expect that it, it could change and being in Cumberland County, we're probably going to be the, the one of the districts that sort of may, may be changing more rapidly as we go into the, the winter months. Yeah, I, ha I have no idea about, you know, what, what the data will even look like to put us into a red. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, okay. They've not shared that. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Thank Heather. you, Hope. Um, can I get to Phil first, Laura? And then I'll get to oh, you. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Let's listen yeah, to uh, Phil and then hope. Yeah, thanks, and then, uh, thanks Laura, Sorry. Well, th uh, thank you, Donna. It's that was very helpful and interesting to see and see how much work has gone into this. First of all, it's the first I've really heard the details. I have. I just wrote down a couple of questions because, like all of us, we we get questions from our neighbors and community members as board members. So I kind of I wanted to bring a couple of those questions to the forefront that I received. It may not have answers, but um, two questions just kept coming up, and maybe it's more too specific at this point, but one was um, we've landed, it sounds like, on the maroon and gold the every other day. Did you consider an every other week schedule where you keep groups together? I got that question a couple times, um, and I'm sure there's good reason why you didn't do that, but it'd be helpful just to sort of think, uh, hear that process you went through. And then the and second sort of related to that um, was, uh, did you think through different schedules for different schools based on uh, the potential for maybe younger people who may, you know, may need to go back, be in school more often, or it's harder for them to do distance learning um, versus high schoolers. Was that considered? And I, I, I hear that it, we're not doing that, but it would be just good to hear the, the thought process behind those two questions. So, thank, thank you. Yeah. So we did talk about um, we did talk about the every other week, and we decided that that would um, provide and principals jump in. Um, it would there would be too much of a gap between learning so students go every week and then they're off for a whole week and we just decided that there would be too much of a learning gap we really want to keep our kids engaged and in school as much as possible um, in some kind of a schedule and we looked at that schedule because um, and thinking about um, as I said before um, putting families on the same schedule we thought it would be easier and less confusing for them um, so we did want to work on that. What was your second question? 
my second question was um, whether there was any consideration about having uh, younger kids go more days oh. and o older kids stay out more. It's just yeah. more of a so, question than anything that I was getting a couple times, so I thought I'd yeah. pass that along. That would still be a possibility in that yellow, um, in that yellow zone. Um, and we did, we have talked about that. And um, as of last week, we were kind of expecting that we would get that direction from the state because um, I was hearing that we might be directed to send our K-5. Um, and I know that um, I've talked to Troy and he said, please, can we keep the middle school all the same? Um, it'd be really difficult to have one group go back, one grade go back, um, all you know every week all week and have the rest of the school on an every other day schedule um but um that that may be coming um we're not ruling that out and i know that jason and i have talked and he's talked with his staff and um you know we that's one of the things that we we may move to but that would fall in that yellow with with um the hybrid Laura, thank you for waiting. You have to unmute now. You're muted. <laughs> Gracious. Oh, rookie mistake. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I just want to say thank you, uh, everyone, for all the hard work and thoughtful consideration that has gone into all these plans, planning for every different scenario. And, and I think everybody was looking for, or is looking for a definitive answer, like let's just know what we're doing, but it sounds like we can't get that answer. Now we know why, so the clarity is, is very good for the community. In the yellow hybrid model, because it does look like, okay, all, all, you know, we, we don't know for sure, but if we can somehow plan on this yellow hybrid model, do we have, first, and I saw some questions come on, on the chat, so I wanna clarify some of those. So, if they're on alternate schedule, like a Monday, Wednesday, or a Tuesday, Thursday, that would be a full day? Is that a full day or yes. for that? And the half day would be the alternate Fridays. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so as I saw some questions come, up, come across on that. And then when would we know sort of if our, if our children would be a Monday, Wednesday, or a Tuesday, Thursday? If, so we say, okay, this is hypothetical, we don't know for sure. But if we do go to the yellow hybrid model, you can ensure that your child or children would be on these days so that we can, as parents, plan. Yeah. So that's my first question. The principals are almost there um, with their lists. So um, I, probably the end of next, by the end of next week, I'm hope, we're hoping. It's not a guarantee, but it's, they're getting really close. So we, okay. know that, we know that people are waiting, waiting for that, and it's really important to move forward with plans. So we're, we're yeah. trying to get that done as soon as possible. There are a few um, okay. missing pieces that we're waiting for, but. Um. So end of next week is the goal. And then there was some other questions on just for the, for the um, remote learning days. So say there is the hybrid model for those two days that are remote learning or 2.5 days or some, some weeks would be three days from a time commitment for the student, is there, is there any idea for, for the parents? Like if you have an elementary school student, you could expect X amount of hours of, of workload or middle school student would be such and high school student would be considered a full day of assignments and, and learning. I know that they are. It does, or does it depend on the teacher or how, how does that work? Well, I know that the principals are working on that with their staff and we do want to come out with a set of um, consistent expectations. So that will be okay. coming. That will be coming soon too. All right. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thanks, Laura. Thanks. Um, Elizabeth had some comments or questions. You're muted still, Elizabeth. Sorry, I thought I unmuted. There we go. Um, I wanted to thank everybody. Um, I felt like the the nurses have carried a very heavy load this summer, as well as administrators and Donna. So I just I need to thank everybody for their hard work. I hope you get a day off someday and get to sleep a full night at some point. So thank you, everybody. Um, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about and I know this, this is gonna sound like a, hard, a harsh way to talk about it, but kind of like mask enforcement. 
um, it sounds like in order for everybody to, to be safe, we have to um, rely on everybody's compliance. And yeah. so um, having been on the committee, I'm already sort of preparing, I'm preparing my kids, I'm preparing, you know, neighbors who ask me questions and that sort of thing that, you know, yes, your student will be required to wear a face covering. And there are people who have philosophical objections to science, I guess, and don't prefer to wear a mask. And, you know, I, I don't know what to, to say to them as far as if they walk in the door of the high school. Um, my feeling is that the student would be required to wear a mask if, if he or she didn't have one, given one if they say they don't have one or they forgot it. Or what? Or, or you know, do we call the parent and say, okay, you have to come get your child. Your child's not complying. Or like, how do we do this? Well, we would have some masks available. We've been we've been ordering, and the state just um, put in an order. Uh, we put in an order to the state, so we do have some masks available. Students will be expected to wear masks, um, and um, if they're not compliant, we'll we will be calling families. Um, it. it has to be understood that to keep people as safe as possible, students and staff need to wear masks. I can um, answer a little bit of Elizabeth's um, questions there and uncertainty there. When meeting with our middle school today, um, I, after sharing with them what we just shared with you with, that, um, with our building level committee, um, I said, okay, we've shared our game plan with you. And that's what it is. We're going into this game and we are the underdogs and we're needing to defeat COVID-19 pandemic. And the only way that we have a shot is to follow these guidelines. We're all excited to get back into school. We all want that sense of normal. Um, and we're gonna do the best we can. And that's why we've had this team working hard all summer long to come up with what that looks like, how we can bring people back in the safest way possible. But that requires compliance from each and every one of us, um, everyone in our community, every student, every staff member, um, every parent, because one person doesn't do their part um, on the field. One person doesn't execute our game plan per to perfection and we don't even stand a chance. The only way we stand a chance is for everybody to do their part and play their role. And that we may still, like even if we execute this plan perfectly with all these safety precautions in place that we've developed, um, even if we execute it perfectly, we are the underdog. We may not um, win, we may be defeated, but we will know that, hey, we gave it our best shot. Um, so the, as far as the masks go, um, we saw what happens with when Governor Mills makes it a recommendation versus a requirement. So when it was a recommendation, I was in the gas station and I was sometimes the only one with the mask on. Um, now that it's a requirement, we're seeing more compliance. So the protocols that we have in place are not recommendations, they are requirements. And um, that's the only way that we can all do our best part. And if there are concerns around wearing a mask or if it's difficult for a student or a staff member to wear a mask, then they should um, contact administrator, their administrator in their building for, um, to see what their alternate accommodations could be. And remote learning would be um, what that would look like for them. If they're coming into the building, it's required, a mask is worn 100% of the time. Unless they're eating. <laughs> unless, sorry, unless they're eating, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we do allow them to eat. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Uh, Kimberly has another comment. And then Nasser, it looks like you have something. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that broke up on me. Did, were you calling on me, Heather Kimberly, or were you um, going to Nasser? Yes. Nope, go ahead, Kimberly. Okay. All right. Um, yes, I, I want to. Um, just a, a huge shout out to um, Donna and the nurses and all the administrators and the staff who have um, really just spent your entire summer on this, um, you know, day after day, hour after hour, researching, planning, and replanning, um, and your thoughtful um, consideration to safety and um, learning and the social and emotional well-being of the students. Um, is admirable and appreciated. Um, 
I wondered, um, I had two questions, um, thinking about, um, thinking about the alternating days and recognizing that, um, you know, a lot of our teachers uh, may have students in other districts who, are, you know, are going to school other days. Um, how, how are we making, how's it going to work for our, for our teachers, I guess? Um, you know, I, we obviously want to support them as much as we can in this time and, um, and you know, and also um, educate our students and, you know, so how is, how do we anticipate that's going to look? Um, and then um, just wondering about the school days, is it, is it a regular full day that we're anticipating, you know, sort of the similar hours that our students attended previously? Um, are we, is that what we're anticipating uh, Monday through Thursday with the half day Friday? And um, does, does that, um, yes, I guess I'll stop right there for the moment. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll answer your last question first. So um, yeah, so it would be a regular school day, except for Friday, which would be a half day. So about the same hours. Um, it may, it will take us longer to do our bus runs. So we know that um, students will probably be arriving in, um, in waves to school and then leaving in waves. Um, but because we have limited uh, space on the bus, limited seating on the bus, we, we do know that um, that the bus routes will be, the bus runs will be shorter, but there may be more of them and it will take longer. So um, we're anticipating that. Um, as far as other districts, I know that this, the whole childcare thing is a concern for superintendents. Um, at least I know in Cumberland County, we discussed it uh, the last couple meetings we've had, and I'm sure we'll be discussing it again tomorrow. One of the things we agreed on at the last meeting, um, we do have superintendent's agreements that are available, and we all agreed that we would, um, in order to allow our staff, and we have a lot of staff that bring that have their students attend school in Cape Elizabeth anyway, but um, just um, we wanted it stated that we would be um, very flexible in allowing for superintendent's agreement. So if if uh, staff wanted to bring their students. Um, to at least to those those two days that they would be in school here that um, that that we would certainly allow that I talked to Kathy Raftis today from um, from our community services and I had asked her a couple weeks ago if they had been thinking about providing any additional child care um, this year and they are meeting on Thursday to talk about that um, so that's also another option I do understand that um, within the community, there are some pods of um, families that are getting together to try to um, address the childcare issue as parents go back to work and um, try to help each other. And I think that's a great idea um, to, um, you know, watch each other's children and just arrange for um, ways that the community can help each other with, with the childcare situation, so. I know, I, we realize it's a, it's a huge issue. I know. Go ahead, Kimberly. Did you have more? No. No, I was just saying, uh, no. thank you. I appreciate the response. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth has her hand raised again. Um, I think Nasser was next. Oh, yes. Nasser. Okay, I may be able to stop Elizabeth uh, asking questions too, because... Uh, um, oh, no, you so, can't, Nasser. You never will. <laughs> uh, because I feel like uh, we all are asking questions, and I'm asking questions, and uh, the administration is doing their best to answer it. And the answer may be correct now, but the answer may be wrong in the future. Everything is a moving target. Every single thing is a moving target. So, for example, my question I asked in the chat was, what if there were 10 students who were positive within a month? Do we close the school? What do we do? Uh, so there's a lot of hypothetical questions. I was wondering if, I think Noel is um, uh, here, our IT guy, and I was wondering if we can establish a forum or a place where all of us can just send all of our questions and concerns and make an FAQ out of it and have provide that for all our community 
uh, if that has not already been done. So yeah, actually, NASA, we're, we're starting that for the teacher. I was just working on that. And I thought, you know, that's probably a good idea for the community. I'm not sure if I could keep up with the questions, but I would try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, so that's it. That was just more. Thank you. That's a great idea. Thank you, Nasser. Uh, Elizabeth. Um, I just want to circle back Phil. to kind of something that Kimberly brought up, which is um, that I'm I'm hearing from neighbors in the Facebook community that someone or some people have started um, a kind of a cooperative or something to look at childcare and supporting education. And um, it would be great if we were able to, you know, amplify that or direct people to somebody because not everybody has access to Facebook or people don't choose to use Facebook. So I'm reaching out. Um, I was kind of aware when that group got started and I don't remember who started it. And um, it, it, so whoever whoever you are out there, it would be great to to reach out to the school department, I think, in case, you know, we have families reach out to us and then we can say, hey, we know of this and you might want to, you know, join forces with them. So I just wanted to throw that out there and also say that um, I think it's a great example of parents supporting each other and, you know, us all coming together to make the best of a difficult situation. So it was just really cool to see that on Facebook. I, it was several weeks ago. Um, so I had um, a question and it's sort of along the lines that, that people are talking about as far as our teachers and, and not necessarily directly related to their own childcare, but um, in thinking about the hybrid model, it sounds like teachers would be in the building five days a week and the students would be in buildings less. So I guess my question is, are, you know, are, how are we protecting and, and keeping teachers safe if teachers are in the building five days a week with, with all the, with the students just coming in different days? And then um, I also wanted to hear a little more from the nurses about um, the fact that they will probably have two different spaces because I know nurses have regular traffic and regular customers um, you have students with um, chronic um, diseases and that sort of thing that have to visit the nurse on a daily basis. I, I have um, experience with this in my own family and lots of us do. So I'm just curious how that's going to be managed and, and understanding that we're gonna be asking teachers to kind of take on a little bit higher responsibility maybe for the cuts or the nosebleeds or that sort of thing. So. Two very different questions, but I wanted to get them out there while I had them written down and on my mind. So nurses, do you want to go for the last question? Sure, I'm happy to... Oh, okay, Jill, go. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, so the idea is that we will have two separate office spaces, as mentioned before, um, an office space strictly for well child visits um, where your daily meds are seen, where the first aid visits are seen, um, where your, um, you know, students that you check in on daily um, that are healthy but still need medical care, um, a totally separate office space for that. And then another totally separate office space for anybody exhibiting signs or symptoms related that could potentially be related to COVID-19, the headaches, the sore throats, the runny nose, um, the body aches, of course, fever, all of that would be seen in a totally separate office area where isolation, um, where, you know, there would be room for, to isolate those students. Our assessment's going to look much different and we're receiving guidance from the state and from the CDC and that's being just like everything else, it's ever changing, ever evolving. Uh, we follow that very closely. Um, we have our school physician following that. We follow the CDC guidelines. Um, we're attending main DOE um, updates weekly. Um, they were bi-weekly, now they're weekly with the um, school nurse consultant for the state um, through the DOE. Um, CDC briefings, again, like we're constantly keeping up to date. This isn't just our decision making, but we're following those guidelines. But student visits will look much different and part of our staff education will 
um, reinforce that, that you know, the non-urgent visit should really be discouraged and students shouldn't be accompanied to the office with friends. Um, that should be you know, very strict, you know, who's coming into the nurse's office and which way do they go, um, limiting the numbers, having them wait outside to determine which office they are appropriate to be seen in. Um, and then of course us following um, our guidelines as a healthcare provider to ensure not only our state safety, but the student and staff safety too, and the way we're providing care. And that care is gonna look so much different. So the sore throat, um, well, there, you know, it could potentially go home rather than back to class, very likely. The headache, same way. So it's gonna be um, a much different assessment for us as nurses. Also in regards to PPE, the state is providing PPE, but they first have to acquire it. And like everybody else across the world, those N95 masks, for example, are really hard to come by. And while the state would love to provide those to us, are they really going to be able to provide those to us? And as healthcare professionals, if you look at the numbers for the state of Maine, the positive cases, healthcare professionals make up 23% of the cases right now for the state. So it is frightening. Um, and then we may not have the appropriate PPE. So in doing that, do we, when we're being asked to potentially assess a student in close proximity and remove their mask to get their sore throat, that assessment might not happen. Um, it might be based on student report. Um, and so it's gonna just be really tricky, but we're gonna be extremely cautious in the way we provide the care and make sure that we have separate areas, a clean area and an area for students or staff exhibiting symptoms. And then the question about the scheduling is, yes, teachers would be in their classrooms for um, four or five days um, following CDC guidelines and the, the main framework's guide, guidelines. Thank you. I just felt like that needed some clarification. And before I mute for good, I want to circle back around to Nasser's original question, which is something that I actually have been hearing from neighbors a lot too, which is um, if we have a student test positive, what happens? And then I think he went even further to say, what if we have several students? And so I know that we might not know the answer, but we, we can probably get close to it. So and I think we really do know the answer to that, and that is that we follow what uh, CDC tells us to do. Um, I know personally, I just experienced a COVID in my family. I have not been near them, but my grandsons and my son were just tested positive for COVID. They're fine. Um, but um, they were contacted by the CDC and given uh, directions immediately about what to do about self-isolation, retesting. Um, the CDC is, um, is pretty on it about contacting people who test positive. So um, they also, um, if you remember last spring, they also contacted um, me right away and, and uh, Jill right away and gave us guidance. So um, we would take our guidance from the CDC and we would do what they said. <laughs> All right, uh, Phil. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to go again. I, a couple more questions. And I know, uh, Heather, you're going to get to some of the questions of people writing in the chats because there's some good ones there. So I don't want to reiterate those. Yeah, can I, can I just speak to that for one second before sure. you get going, Phil? Yes. I am actually, as I'm listening, making a document. So these questions that people, there's a lot of conversation happening in mm -hmm. the chat and it's worthy and they're not going to be lost. Um, I, I, timing is getting tricky. I'm not sure how they're going to be answering, but I'm, I'm pasting them onto a document so that we can at least follow through at some, at some point. So I just, I just want to let people know that. Thanks Heather. I'm glad you addressed that. Um, Cause there are some good questions there. Uh, so yes. my I have two different questions that I don't think have been asked yet. One is I think we've all been asked a lot about what can we do as volunteers and um, you know, we get that, I get that question quite frequently. People want to help in the community and whether it's from designing classroom spaces to outdoor spaces to uh, people have shared the Gorham volunteer um, initiative. Is there a way for people to do that or is there something for people to do who want to participate? So that's one question and I know um, there, that's, an, you know, managing and working with volunteers is, is a lot of work too and I know you guys are working with a lot of things but there is that need out there. And the, and the second question, um, 
is actually really about cost. I, I, it's not really about the specifics here, but this is our first meeting since the governor announced the CARES Act funding. And I, first I wanna say thank you to the community for overwhelmingly supporting our budget um, that just passed. But these uh, initiatives you're talking about are gonna cost a lot of money um, and uh, weren't you know, all included in the budget. I mean, some of it we did as much as we could, but there's unanticipated costs. Have you gotten any word from you know the governor's office on how that will be um, distributed and will it make a dent in what we need? So those are my two questions, volunteer and budget. Okay, so um, I'll have to think about the volunteer piece and um, that would probably filter through our office. Um, but I have to think about that, Bill, okay? <laughs> um, and get back to how that would work. Um, so the funding, we did, we were, um, um, given our number this past, I guess early this week, Marcy, I, anyway, it's either late last week or early this week. And we are getting, uh, there's a whole, uh, as a, everything with the state, a formula, and it's based on number of, number of students, number of special ed students, number of um, free and reduced, number, there's a whole spreadsheet that goes on and on. Um, uh, and we, you get a certain amount for each of those that. students. So anyway, we um, ended up with 1,052,000 something do extra dollars, which sounds like a lot of money and it is a lot of money and, and we're very thankful for that. Um, and we had an administrative meeting today and um, you know, just people kept saying, well, you know, we need to do this and we need to do this. So while it's a lot of money, I think it's, it's, um, it will go quickly. We have to be very careful with it. Um, one of the things we know we need to do is the bus monitors. Um, one of the, another thing I think we need to do is to uh, get some um, administrative assistance for our nurses because they're going to be dealing with a lot of uh, data that's coming in. We need somebody to be able to check those uh, self-assessment reports every day. Um, so those are two big things. There's some technology uh, issues that we have to deal with. So, um, so we're very thankful for that money and we will, we will spend it wisely. It has to be spent by December 30th. So um, we talked about doing some building projects or something like that and we just, they, there's not time to do that. Um, if we hire people, it, um, it's only till December 30th, so it would be a very part-time um, temporary position. And it can't be anything that was already in our budget this year um, that we, that we um, are replacing it with. So, um, so there are some um, requirements that we have to follow, but, um, but we're very thankful for that funding and it will help um, as we proceed through these next couple months. Great, thank you, Donna. I would say if anybody, Phil, right now has ideas for how they would like to volunteer, what they, they could call, um, they could call my office and leave the information with Jen and then um, we could figure it out. Um, okay. I am just, wow, overwhelmed, <laughs> uh, as I know everybody is. Um, I would like to just pause for a moment. Um, are there any other comments from school board members? It looks like we've had some good discussion. Um, here's where I would like to go. I'd like to acknowledge the time. We're at 8.35. Um, there, I've already copied um, two or three pages and I've just found out that I can somehow save them. Um, but of, of questions from people that have been put into the chat, I'm sure there's, there's questions that are not into the chat. Um, I, I think there's no way that we can vote on any of this without um, further conversation and hearing from the public. Uh, and I don't expect that to happen within a few minutes. So I'm opening it to the school board and to Donna to figure out the next steps right now um, on, on how we should proceed. Uh, like I said, I don't think we're at a point. I think we're at our designated stopping point, 
I don't think we're at a point to vote. I don't think we've heard um, from the people in the meeting who uh, we wanted to give a chance to speak. So we can either commit to more time and give a time frame, and now shift over to some of the questions in the in the um, chat room. Um, so I'm open to. I, I don't want to take too long to talk about this, but to school board members on your thoughts on that. Heather, this is Phil. I'd like to, assuming everyone agrees, hear from people. I get, you know, we did let people know that they could speak after this agenda item. And so the, the people who have waited, um, you know, maybe we don't get to vote on it tonight, but I, I do think we should let uh, people who want to speak tonight on this topic speak. I think it'll be helpful for us to hear that. Absolutely. So you're okay with going a little bit longer and later? I agree yep. with Phil. Okay. Um, anybody else anybody just else speak just up speak in the board? Uh, this is Kimberly and um, I agree. I think people set this time aside and, um, and we let them know that they have a chance to um, share their thoughts and concerns. And I think it also um, is useful to to get their thoughts out there um, on the sooner end for for future, you know, the, as the planning continues to go on. Okay. Laura Hope Nasser. Yes, we can stay longer. And uh, okay. I said in my chat that those staff who have read the questions already, and if they can address those questions quickly right away, I think they should there should be no particular order, but address the one that you have answers for. Okay. Hope and... Yeah, I agree. I think if, if they've made it this far in the meeting, we should uh, take some comments and, and get some input. Okay. And Laura, are you okay with this? I'm on mute. Yes, I agree. We should hear from the people. They've waited a long time to speak, so they're okay. deserving of that. Okay. I'm going to just start from the beginning and read them out loud. Um, Chola Foote has said, would it be appropriate to ask why the AA half day Wednesday BB schedule was not chosen? Is this due to staff PD or Friday afternoon? Could staff PD be done while cleaning takes place on Wednesday afternoons. Consistency of exposure, consistency of learning seems like it would work better if children were attending on consecutive days. So I don't know if any of the principals want to so talk. Well, there we go again. Um, but we did talk about doing that. And uh, again, there was, we felt it was um, more beneficial for students to at least come every other day rather than to come two days in a row and then be off on uh, the next two days. Um, we talked to Perry about um, Wednesdays and the benefit of you know, having a whole day uh, to clean. And he felt that his staff could handle the cleaning and disinfecting, not the cleaning, but the disinfecting and sanitizing um, after school each day, um, during and after school each day on Monday through Thursday. So we did talk about um, both plans, um, but just all agreed that um, the ABAB we thought would be uh, more beneficial for our students. Great. Uh, Rebecca Roth wrote, thank you, Donna, for your presentation. Can you provide a bit more detail on the yellow plan? One, are the two days full or half days in school? Full days. If they are half days, why? So full days. What is the plan for the two, three days when kids are at home? Um, the, the two, three days? Uh, I believe that will be different at each school, but there will be, I don't know, maybe... Um, Troy, do you want to talk about what your plan is? Your plan's a little bit different. Sure, I can. And it's obviously it's outlined with the big lettered word draft over the top of it. So um, we are currently working on in an effort to, well, there's a couple of things because I've read through the chat as well. And, and somewhere in there it said, you know, it's, it's really a lot to think that people are going to teach live in person in the same day, do some type of remote teaching. I think that's really not that realistic of a thought. Um, it's also 
students are home on that off, off day and they do need to be continuing to work and learn. So there'll be some aspect of the content teachers providing that instruction during that time. It might be extension activities, research, you know, some of it will be kind of some typical homework, but that's kind of, that is a, that's a plan. Um, for us, what we're really looking at is in order, it all kind of goes together in the potting idea of trying to keep the smallest groups and pod sizes. Um, one idea we're floating around and it's not set in stone yet, we're still working on it, is the idea of having our allied arts teachers be the remote teaching kind of option, the direct instruction for that day that students are home. Um, that's not to say there's not some content area work to still be done by students, but the direct contact would be limited potentially to the allied arts teachers. Um, that way, it's kind of hard to have people blowing in trumpets and horns and think that an airborne thing is not going to fly around the room. So um, it's really hard to keep the integrity, I think, of our band, our music, our phys ed, even our art room, you know, trying to disinfect between every group of kids that touch markers or paintbrushes or, or whatever it is. So they seem to be the group that has the most potential because they also see about 150 kids per quarter versus the 35. So it's, it's really kind of causing a lot of potential cross-pollination for staff and for students and, and all of that. Um, so right now, that is one potential plan that we have at the middle school. So it would also take out a class, so to speak, during the regular day. So instead of seven blocks, there'd be six. It would help, I think, lit mitigate some of that later kind of arrivals and the later, maybe the, some of the earlier needs for dismissals. Um, so that, that's one idea that we have, and it's really, I think, helpful and beneficial to everybody on a couple of ways. And one is it allows for more potting. It limits the need for students to be traveling through the building from one room to another. Um, we've talked with our world language teachers. They would be obviously working, you know, in school, in person, and they would be, at least in the fifth and sixth grade, traveling to the classrooms that kids are in, as opposed to having them travel to the, their might, what might be on the other end of the building, a classroom. So um, this all kind of goes together. I don't think any of it can happen in isolation. And if we have our allied arts teachers doing that job, I think it eliminates some of the potential feedback we were getting from last year of my, my students checking in with way too many people in a day. Um, you know, they're trying to get to eight different teachers and all of this stuff. And I, and I know our allied arts teachers were feeling as though they were not a priority, which I think for emergency remote learning, that might've been okay, but I don't think that's okay to continue on that path. So um, I think this would really value their programming and it would allow them to keep the integrity of it without really changing it as much. So that's some of our current thinking. Um, it's also going to be slightly different for that whole group of students and families that opt out and opt to be at for remote learning. We're trying to identify a team of teachers, as Donna had said earlier, to, to kind of meet those needs. So there's a lot of work going on in that. And I just think that we have to be very realistic about what we expect from our teachers when they have kids in person. Um, and I think on the same feeling, the learning can't stop on that one day. There still has to be learning going on on the other day in our content areas as well. So that's some of the work and the progress and in, in where we're currently at talking about it. Thanks, Dora. Yep. Uh, a third part to her question is, has the school considered specific technology like Swivel for the teachers to use yeah. and training for teachers on how to improve in doing interactive Zoom lessons? So Noel, do you want to say anything about that? Are you still on? Yes, I'm still on. Okay. Uh, we looked into um, the other product, I forget what the name of it is, but we're, you know, at the beginning of the school, we're, we set aside the first week of school to have teachers um, be mentors to other teachers of how things went well in our um, springtime and what could be approved. Um, I also noticed a couple questions in the chat, iPads and um, devices will be available um, at the very beginning of school and be ready for the, the uh, the students. Uh, we have talked about um, doing one or two grades at a time. Um, again, you know, all this is talking. So at that time, they would get their devices. Um, and the other thing is um, uh, Zoom versus Google Meet. Um, thanks to our new little budget there. When, we, when we're talking about Zoom today, an alternative. Um, Google Meet is 
is trying like heck to catch up to Zoom. And the one advantage with Google Me is the fact that all the teachers have been using it. And so they're very familiar with it. However, if it doesn't have the same capabilities as Zoom, such as breakout rooms and, and such, then obviously we will go to Zoom and, and uh, use some of that funding that was provided to us to um, pay for it. Yeah, Kathy Stankert is going to pull together a committee of teachers and um, tech integrators to have a conversation about Zoom versus Google. So that will be happening uh, probably next week, I would assume. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Eliza Matheson asked, for the families who opt in for full remote for the first semester, will they be uh, separated out from the remote learning portion of the hybrid model? Yes. Will the number of opt-in remote online classes be based on demand? I'm not sure what that means, but okay. the number of classes. Um, what, what we're thinking Maybe is... she's here and she could clarify. Well, but what, let me just say um, what we're thinking about at Palm Cove and um, middle school is um, staff would be assigned to students who were doing remote learning and, and they would be essentially their own mini class and they would do their remote learning program. Um, in Pond Cove, it might be a multi-age situation where a teacher might have, you know, a few students in one grade and a few students in another grade, but they would be assigned to that teacher um, for the semester. So that they would be doing their remote learning um, with, that, with that teacher. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Does the district have universal social emotional screening in place to best assess the needs of all students? That's what the committee is going to work on when they get together. Um, in the remote learning sen uh, setting, will administrators require virtual meetings between staff and students? I don't know if required. I think it's as needed. This is from Jen McVeigh. Can you read that again, Heather? In the remote learning setting, will oh. administrators require virtual meetings with between staff and students? Well, I think I think there'd be a lot of virtual meetings between staff and student in that remote. Yeah. yeah. If that's if that's that's how I understand the question. But yes, that would, they would be that, those students' teachers. Mm -hmm. So yes, there would be a lot of meeting. Joe Moriarty asks, what happens if the parent doesn't complete the form that the nurses require um, and they just won't be able to come to school? It's part of the requirement. You can't come through the building. That's correct. Yep. Melanie Thomas asks, could someone explain the difference semesters to us. If a child commits to a first semester of remote learning, what months would that consist of? Okay, we had a date today. It's in January. Jeff, do you remember that date? January? It's typically the end of the third week in January. Um, okay, and then this is a question clarification uh, that each school will not check student temperature before entering the schools. Um, are you stating that it's up to the parents as of now? That's the new guideline. So correct. That's correct. Um, what about the children's parents who leave to work before their child even wakes up? Is it up to the younger child to check their own temperature? Well, hopefully if the child is young enough, there's somebody there that's watching them or can help with that. And if they're old enough, um, I don't know. We haven't really talked about whether they can do their own self-assessment, but um, I would imagine, I don't know if the nurses want to weigh in on that, but I imagine that um, if the child was old enough, they could do their own self-assessment. They would have to be trained, but nurse, any nurses want to weigh in on that? Yeah, the, um, one other thing we had talked about, um, as for the parents who would be doing the assessments at home, um, we are looking into some form of communication that parents would then report back to the school what their if their child had symptoms then no their child's not coming to school today or their child was cleared to go and so one of the tracking methods we would do is to look did 
certain student, if they weren't screened, if we don't have a yes or a no from them, then the nurses are going to find those students, do a screening, um, but we would also be in touch with the families to let them know that their child hadn't been screened that day. So if they clear a screening with us, they go to class. If they don't clear a screening with us, then we would send them home. Would students, um, would we accept students doing their own self-assessment? I think probably, I mean, we would definitely have to probably discuss it more, but I would think at the high school level, if students, the, especially the students who would be driving themselves to school who are old enough to be able to know, do I feel unwell today? Do I have a fever? Um, am I showing any symptoms? I mean, I think at some point that might have to be the honor system of that student coming into school. And that honor system is so incredibly port important. And I have been advocating for this piece for a long time. I just want to get my opinion out there. It is not the recommendation of the CDC nor the main DOE that we do these screenings upon arrival any longer. However, that does create some, you know, gaps here. So the idea to do them upon arrival was to prevent students from entering and staff from entering the building, even, you know, stepping foot into the building to minimize that exposure. Um, will we capture very many? Probably not through this. And that's why it's not recommended um, right now through the, you know, those groups. But um, it, you know, by not doing it upon arrival, we are really relying again on the compliance of everyone at home. And again, we all need to be that team player um, and meet our expectations. But you know, once they're in the building and by the time we've tracked the data to see who has and has not completed that screening, by the time I have that data and get into that student's classroom or staff member's classroom and it's third or fourth period and how do I explain that, that, you know, I'm sorry that our school was exposed. Um, we have a positive screening here and the child or staff member has been here for three to four hours. So it gets really tricky and there it does create some room for gaps um, and for students conducting their own screenings, things like that. There are, you know, we don't have all the answers here, but it is a bit tricky. Um, so we are following the guidelines, but it does leave some room for, uh, you know, potential exposure. Right. Katie McGovern asks, the red, yellow, green matrix is guidance from the state and the district that makes its own decision correct? She's looking for clarification. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Melanie Tennyson asks, can someone bring up an expectation um, that if families travel, that they quarantine if traveling to state areas with high numbers? Has that been addressed? Yeah, so we so, have outlined in our employee handbook, and I believe in our parent student handbook as well that will be put out there. So. Yes, we have addressed that. Okay, thank you. Maureen Clancy asks, if high school students attend PATHS, will that work with this schedule? Will that be happening? Oh, no. Okay, Jeff, go right to pick that. that. Okay, I already cut out the view and everything. I need oh, to keep I listening. Oh, I think somebody needs to put their, there, there we go. Question. Go ahead, Donna. Oh, I was going to Jeff, Jeff said to address the PATHS issue. Yes, uh, our, this, what we have in mind for any of the models of learning that we have will work with PATHS. And I've been in communication with Kevin Stilfen, who's the director of PATHS, and he's well aware of what we're planning on doing. So yeah, it will work. Great. Uh, Joan Moriarty, the main office administrative secretaries see the kids first. Will we be expected to do the policing when they arrive at school, if the student is not wearing a mask or complying with the CDC requirements? So I understand that at the high school and the middle school, they are purchasing a, a check-in system for their late, the students who are late, so they can scan themselves in. And so the secretaries, the administrative assistants will not be responsible for any close contact with those students. And they certainly will not re be responsible, although they might remind students to wear masks, but that, that would be the administrator's responsibility. Okay. Did that answer um, the question, Joan? Okay. Hopefully she's still here. She is. Okay. Um, yes, but I just, 
I guess it, it does answer your, my question, but um, sometimes the administrators aren't here to enforce any of that. So um, anyway, that's that. That was my question. Uh, I who think would, to. You would remind them, but that's where that's as far as I could go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lindsay Waite, uh, there was a question actually from Heather Bryant who um, wanted to know about outside instruction as long as possible. It seems like the kids could be mask free if outside in space. Are they going to be required to be masked outside at recess? We haven't talked about that. Um, we haven't talked about that. So. so that's a good thing to follow through with. Thank yeah. you for bringing that up. The guidelines and the CDC requirements, um, they say students will wear masks. They don't say if they're outside. So they don't um, differentiate between inside and outside. So, um, you know, on the playground, it's going to be difficult to keep social distancing um, if students do go out on the playground. Um, if it's a learning situation, it's a little bit different because you may uh, give students their spaces to work in. So I think it would depend on the situation and uh, we will talk more about that. We haven't gotten to recess yet. Okay. Lindsay Waite, is recess happening? Uh, that's a question we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, playtime uh, physical activity outside the classroom. Yeah, so let's, Jason, are you still with us? And what are you thinking about recess? Have you had that discussion? I am here. Um, so we haven't had detail. We've had quite a few discussions about recess, but um, of course, we're going to be looking at the guidelines at the time. Um, certainly, there's every intention of providing outside time and play time. Exactly what that will look like. Um, <clears throat> more information to come on that, but yep. there will certainly be, you know, the, the decisions will be based on the guidelines. Will we, will we use equipment or will we provide opportunities for um, play and physical activity in a different way. Um, and we're looking into that. Okay. Lindsay Waite asked, how will teachers facilitate online learning when they are also in the classroom five days a week? That seems like two whole jobs. And I think um, Troy addressed that in his answer. Um, Jeff, do you want to talk about that at the high school? Did we lose Jeff? Oh. No, I'm, I'm here. Um, so I, I don't have a solid answer for that right now. I mean, it, I, except it sort of depends. I can imagine a number of different ways that it could work. Um, for example, on a Monday, if, a student, if the teacher is meeting with a group of kids, they can do some live instruction, record themselves, um, uh, ass assign some homework that would last over a couple of days and maybe some work to do at home for the next day as well. So I, I think that's one model, um, but, but I really don't know if that's the best model or the right model. Um, one of the things that I think we have talked about on the school planning team is that whatever model we choose, we have to make sure that we can make it work for kids who cannot access the internet in real time uh, because of family circumstances at home. So that becomes a little tricky, but it's, a, it's something we're dedicated to figuring out. Um, I also think there's some unknowns in terms of, you know, I can, I can imagine, and, and a group of teachers and I have talked about some other ways to do this as well. There are a number of ways to do it, but they sort of depend on the ability, how much, how much traffic can our pipeline at school handle is sort of an unknown. And it, it's really hard to test it until you get into the situation to figure out. So that's another reason why having a slow glide path at the beginning of school to the start of real school is going to be important because it's going to allow us to test out some different modalities i think but the short answer is i don't know it depends it's very much on our radar as a question we have to answer 
And I know at the, at the elementary school, um, we've talked um, in a team about, you know, students being in daycare and um, not being able to expect them when, when they're on their off day um, to be tuning into classes because they, who knows where they'll be. Um, they'll, and, um, you know, day, I don't think it's uh, realistic to expect daycare providers to be uh, having kids tune into their um, their classes. So uh, I know that I've heard uh, some of the Pond Cove teachers talk about um, preparing some videos or checking in, um, checking in with them. Um, so I, I think those questions are very much still in um, acknowledgement that obviously a teacher can't be teaching in the classroom all day and doing a remote learning situation um, at home all day. So that's just not going to work. So, uh, so uh, schools are talking about and working with teachers to work on those plans. So I guess that um, I just want to reiterate for that is that that's in the conversation that's acknowledged that's that's absolutely you know very much in the awareness and we do still have time before we go back to school and mm -hmm. that's one of the big conversations that will be happening about how to manage that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brie Gallagher writes, um, yes, two jobs for sure. I would like to see Fridays for everyone, which would allow teachers some time to plan their in-person and remote lessons, including creative learning videos and responding to emails from parents, students regarding. Um, I heard that one of the reasons for having the half day was to try to maximize in-class connection. Is that correct? That's correct. The, the in-person. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, uh, right. Are teachers providing our own PPEs or will the school be able to help out with that? So the school, we will have some PPE, depending on how much we get. Um, I, I think probably most teachers would prefer to wear a PPE of their choosing, but if not, we, have, we will have some on hand to provide. I, I have a box of them in my office right now, and more is coming, so. Okay. Masks. Um, Karen Dow asks, what about subs if teachers have to isolate at home or if teachers' children have to isolate? How many days does isolation last to meet the guidelines once you are symptom free? So, so two sub, questions. Subs is going to be a huge problem. And we talk about that at almost every A team meeting. We realize, you know, on on a good day in a regular in a regular year, subs are an issue. So we know that that is going to be a problem. Um, we're hoping that there's some community community members out there that um, might be um, interested in substituting. And I would urge you to uh, call our HR department at central office uh, to sign up for subbing. Um, if obviously, if we don't have teachers in our classrooms, uh, we can't we can't. Uh, have our kids in our classroom. So it is, we know that it's going to be a huge issue. It's going to be a huge issue throughout the state. And um, one of our thoughts was to have uh, teachers team up uh, so that if a, a sub was in um, one of the, the alternate class, um, that uh, the teacher that was there could help out. But uh, we, we realized that that the sub is issue is going to be huge. It could shut us down. As far as the days coming back, um, we do have that outlined and it really is um, about um, main CDC guidance. Um, but we, we have that outlined. There's a flow chart about that that will be in the handbooks. Great. Um, and actually, if if um, if staff go on onto the um, supporting documents for this meeting, you'll see that the draft of that handbook. So you can you'll see that there's a flow chart. Okay. Um, right. Uh, 
Uh, Three Gallagher asks, what about a presumptive positive case? Testing and contact tracing has been inconsistently available. Should not our district have their own plan if a student's test positive or is presumptive positive, at least in the short term? Our plan is to follow CDC guidelines. I don't know, nurses, do you have um, any other information on that? Yeah, I mean, we definitely we would be following the local health department recommendations. Um, depending on if we have a positive case from the CDC, they'll direct us to a, a minimum of about two to five days of closure to allow for contact tracing and to have us have a better understanding of the COVID situation impacting our schools. Um, and then the closure would also help us to determine appropriate next steps, including if we would need to have an extended dismissal duration or if um, we will be able to safely return back to the buildings. Um, but all guidance that we will be receiving is gonna come directly from the CDC. Great. And I can tell you the last time we had that, um, they were right on it, so. Great. Uh, iPhone 81, um, I forget who that was. Uh, live stream, live stream the class and record or simply record the teaching. I'm not sure exactly what that meant. Um, We've talked about the possibilities of, of doing some live streaming and I believe that some of the teachers might be going to try that. Um, we're concerned about our capacity, um, which Jeff talked a little bit about giving us um, some time at the beginning of the year to, to uh, test that out. I don't know if Noel or Jeff want to say anything else about that. I mean, I, I think, I don't know, any, I, I don't think I have anything to add beyond what you just said and what I said before, Donna. I think there are just some unknowns and we're going to have to figure it out. And again, coming back to the idea of a uh, longer than normal orientation period for students, uh, which will also have the side benefit of allowing us to, I mean, it's one thing to talk about these ideas in theory, and it's another thing to see what can actually work. So I think there are, would be tremendous advantages in, um, in trying some things and being a little bit experimental. Uh, so that's the best that I have for right now. Noel, do you want to add anything about our capacity? I really don't have anything to add to it. Um, as far as looking at the, uh, again, you know, picking on one application, Google Meet, it looks like the specs, uh, we, we have no issues whatsoever. But then again, you have to add, if we're going to have 50% of our classes uh, full, how, how that adds to it. Um, if I was a betting man and had to bet the house on it, I think we're going to be okay. But again, you know, it's one of the things that we've never done before. So, you know, I don't want to, you know, say, hey, everything's going to be fine. And then we go down this road and we find some hiccups. It's great that uh, we're hopefully going to stagger this a little bit. And like Jeff said, test, test out a couple of the things and see if they're available. Okay, there was a question uh, for Perry. Are ventilation systems being checked and cleaned this summer? Perry. Yeah, we, we do an annual cleaning of, of filters and maintenance every summer, regardless of COVID. And uh, I just wanted to add that we will be adjusting the outside <clears throat> air, fresh air dampers to their fullest open position to bring in as much outside air as possible. Thank you. Um, if teachers have to isolate at home because of our own children's illness, will this be permitted to teach? Will we be permitted to teach from home? Runny noses and coughs in young children are almost constant April to, or August to April. That's really going to depend on the, the grade level and situation. Um, it would, you know, if we could find a sub that would come in and be with the class and the teacher could teach from home, then it, it might work or really it will depend on the situation, the grade level. Um, we would certainly 
try to work with that, but I can't guarantee that, that, that we can make that work. Okay. Um, John Volz wants to know, as soon as you are able, it would be help to know what happens if a student tests positive, even in a general way, just like we all know what happens in a fire drill. So just some information that somebody would like. If a teacher contracts COVID, will we be able to have substitute teachers? What are the responsibilities for the teacher who becomes ill? I think we've addressed that. Um, in the event that we have to go 100% remote, um, Lisa Melanthin urges technology department to purchase Zoom licenses for students and teachers. Um, I think that we're, that's we're something looking. we're looking into. Um, and we're also very aware of the Google, which is updating and getting better. Um, from LED, um, uh, I think the last recorded in the chat. Um, do you have plans for consistent guidelines for attendance and online expectations on remote days? We will be working on those, but we will have those expectations, yes. Will there be more consistency and an expectation for live online learning or will it be homework or taped classes? I think it will be a combination. I don't know if any of the principals want to answer that. I'm assuming they mean the remote learning day. I think we've talked a lot about that, so. Okay. Um, I think what we'll do is there's been a few uh, requests for um, spoken questions. Um, I, I've been told that this will automatically save um, these questions and maybe we can address the rest of the chat questions later. I'd like to give um, till 9.30 and then a hard stop. Our administrators have been working all day. This is a very late night. Um, not to say that this isn't important. Um, I'm trying to balance uh, the needs of everyone right now. Um, and so um, we're gonna pause with the chat and go to in-person questioning. If somebody wants to verbally raise their hand or not, verbally, but use the hand feature. Um, Elizabeth Yarrington, you have the floor. Go ahead and yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. we can. Thank you, Elizabeth. There's my little here. So um, I'll try to make it quick. So I'm, my name is Liz Yarrington. I'm an English teacher at the high school. Um, and I'm also on the, um, on the high school fall planning committee. So I wanted to speak as a teacher, but also as a parent of two young kids, one of whom is right here. Um, while I really want to get back to school in the building, uh, I just want to put it out there that the hybrid model presents really significant logistical challenges for teachers like me whose kids under the hybrid model will be without care for three days a week if they're in public school. Um, so staff like me in this position, I think, have been under tremendous stress thinking about options for how to care for our kids and also in the classroom. Um, but I know that the hybrid model isn't something we can just take off the table. So um, I think there are three things that I have thought of that I think are some practical choices that the district could make that would make um, teaching possible for people like me. So I'm, I'm hoping that the board would consider these three things. Uh, so the first is the fifth day in school, in the school week, should be in line with our neighboring school districts. Uh, this day is gonna be Wednesday in South Portland and Portland. And I know that we thought it would be Friday, but it, that's changed. Um, I think that we, sh we need to be agile here, and I, I really think we should adopt Wednesday as our fifth day as well. Um, this will keep us in line with the PATH schedule, which has always been a top priority for us. Um, because it impacts so many of our students, but it will also make a significant impact for people like me um, who are 
parents of kids in neighboring school districts. Um, in the high school English department alone, there are four teachers who have children attending school in different districts. All of those districts will have Wednesday as the fifth day. Um, so as far as I know, there's nothing special about Friday. I know that's what we chose, but I hope that we can be flexible about this and change our plan to be in line with neighboring districts. Um, I think it will make a big difference for people who are in my position. So that's the first thing. The second thing, the fifth day in the week, I think should be as it will be for South Portland and Portland, a staff only day. Um, we should adopt that as our model as well. And I'll say more about why I think we should do that in a moment. The third thing is with the fifth day um, in the week as a staff only day, if we can adopt that, parents like me and any adult in the building who feels that they should be, would benefit from it, um, should be able to work from home that day. Um, we did it all spring. We know that it's possible. Um, teachers could then be planning and attending meetings from home while we care for our own children. Um, getting childcare for my kindergartner, for instance, for two days instead of three days would be a significant help financially and just logistically. Um, uh, let's see. Um, and while this would be helpful for me as a parent, I think that it would benefit all staff. As teachers know from our experience this spring, remote learning takes an enormous amount of planning. Um, but in a hybrid model, we're planning for in-person learning as well as remote learning. Um, teachers need more planning time under this model. I think the fifth day is a common sense time for this to happen. Um, and while it pains me to take away any possible in-class time for students, even five or 10 minutes, the reality is that the fifth day in the week will only happen for each group of students every other week. That comes out to one half day out of 10. So I think planning time for teachers and flexibility for teacher parents um, are good reasons for us to consider that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jennifer Pollock. You can unmute yourself and speak. Uh, thanks, Heather. I'm sorry I'm not on camera. I, my camera's not working. Um, I'm just also, I, I'm kind of in line with what Elizabeth just said. Um, and as a parent and somebody who also works in a school in the area, um, I'd like to, I'm just wondering if there's a better way to cohort our students. Um, with a Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, <clears throat> there's not really an opportunity for a teachers to have a break or um the building to have a break but if our students went to school monday tuesday in one cohort and then in an elizabeth in an elizabeth model thursday friday yes it would mean three days off or three days at home for half the school and two days in a row and then two days together but it would cohort them better and um, with a with a Wednesday break, which I like, it gives it allows the buildings to be cleaned um, more substantially. So if you have the same group of students there on Monday and Tuesday, the buildings are all cleaned, and then the next group is there Tuesday, Friday, or I'm sorry, Thursday, Friday. <clears throat> then you've cohorted that next group on Thursday and Friday, and if the building isn't quite as clean or something's missed it's still the same group of people that'll be in the building on consecutive days so and that is something that we're we're doing at our school it, it's a, it's a better cohort um and <laughs> um i'm just wondering if if there's any thought to that because i feel like all we're doing now is just getting all of them in in the school consecutive days and there's really there's just so much more chance for spread and infection and it just does it seems like a less safe way to send my child back to school and um and i'm having a really hard time sending her back to school period and then to just know that she's going to be exposed to everybody 
because it doesn't really matter if she's there on Monday and Wednesday or Tuesday and Friday, she's going to be exposed to everybody because there's no break. There's no opportunity for that building to be cleaned. And our janitorial staff is amazing. I've worked with them um, in the parent associations, but there's no way that they can get those buildings that clean in that short amount of time. They'd have to work from the moment the bell rang until the moment the bell rang in the morning. And that just doesn't seem fair to them. Um, and what if one of them gets sick and then there's a spread through the janitorial staff? I mean, I think we're just opening up. It's just really bad. I just think it's just not, I think we just need to cohort them better and that will just make everybody safer. And I like Elizabeth's idea of a, a full break in the middle of the week with nobody in the building. That's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I don't see any other um, hands raised. Uh, John De Delisle? You got That's it. Right. Did I? You got it, yeah, I swear. All right, <laughs> go ahead. Um, Thank you. Um, I just want to throw out some kind of information, some data. I'm not a, a doctor or health professional whatsoever, but uh, I do like my data. Um, so the first confirmed case of COVID in Maine happened on March 12th. And the next day, March 13th, that was the last day that students and staff were in the school. Um, and since then, since school has been closed down, Maine has had um, 38, over 3,800 positive cases. And more than 2,000 of those have happened in Cumberland County. Um, of the 121 deaths that have happened from COVID, 68 of those Mainers were from Cumberland County. Right now, we're at 398 active cases and 204 of them are in Cumberland County. Those 398 cases, active cases, that number is similar to what we saw in April and May when school was closed. So I think my concern is if we're seeing same, the same number of active cases we saw in April and May while school was, while school was closed down, why is it safe now to return um, in a month or so? Um, personally, I feel like, I, and I know that administration has done so much with looking at the, the hybrid model. Um, and I'm very thankful for all the work that's put into that. Um, I just worry about going back to school. Um, I miss my students. I miss um, my colleagues. I miss you know, all the things that we took for granted before COVID happened. Um, but I'm really nervous about myself um, getting sick, my, a family member getting sick, a colleague getting sick, students getting sick. Um, and personally, and this is just my opinion, um, it would be great if we could spend some time looking at um, professional development for remote learning um, rather than just a hybrid learning. And that's my two cents. Uh, thank you for that, John. I'm going to call on Wynn, uh, and then Mark Ash is after Wynn. Go ahead, Wynn. Okay, as you probably know, I had a little spiel uh, prepared before this, but uh, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go into all of it. I'd like to, I think that John has uh, really hit on, and, and I think this is more for the public. I'm kind of speaking as the president of the of the association is the, the teachers are nervous, very nervous. And they are um, also understand, they also understand how important it is to get back in the classroom and they'd love, love nothing more to be able to do that. But, um, you know, there are so many different things that, that, that uh, have come up in this meeting and once again have brought up more anxiety, at least for me. And I was part of the district uh, committee and, um, you know, I think it was a great plan. I think that we did the, the best we could, but it didn't necessarily alleviate any of our fear, any of my fears. You know, I think Elizabeth alluded to how are we going to protect teachers? Um, and she, you know, I, I remember one of the things that was talked about were plexiglass barriers for high, um, high traffic areas. And there's no, there's no higher traffic area than our classrooms. And are we going to have plexiglass barriers? Is that really something that the, the district can afford and uh, uh, to do. Um, you know, I know that, uh, and of course, the, the idea of, of A's were brought up on buses and, you know, are they going to be able to really enforce masks? I mean, kids on buses are, 
you know, they're on buses. You know how they behave. We all were on buses at one time. And, and is that really realistic for us to think that uh, an aide is going to be able to keep all those kids from, from uh, you know, from not taking their masks off? You know, we talked about substitutes, and that's just a huge issue. And um, I would have to suggest that the district is going to have to go back into the uh, substitute handbook and rewrite it for things like, you know, make sure that kids wear masks, make sure that uh, uh, desks are disinfected, and, and so on. I would continue to talk about a lot of different issues, but I know that um, people's time is short. But I think, I, you know, I'd like to say that when, I, when we all started teaching, the last thing we, we um, ever thought was that we'd be doing active shooting drills. Um, and now here we are, um, I don't think any of us ever imagined that we'd be uh, donning masks and uh, going back into school during a pandemic. It's just not what we really signed up for. You know, I also think about, um, we, we, we have come up with a plan. We've done a great job coming up with a plan. I'll remind uh, people of what uh, President Trump said in uh, January, on January 22nd, when the first COVID case in the United States came up. He said, um, what is it that uh, uh, we have a plan you know, and um, it's a good plan. And he went on to say that uh, in another interview that uh, it's gonna be handled very well. Well, that's all fine. And I imagine this all may be fine if everyone follows the rules. And, uh, you know, and, and, if, and if we are all going back to school, you know, I look forward to the very first um, school board meeting and town council meeting in district, cha in, in district chambers uh, the next time you decide to meet because I think that seems only fair. So um, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Ann. Um, Mark Ash, and then it is close to 9.30. I'm gonna uh, Mark to speak and uh, Marsden to speak. Um, and then I think we're gonna call it for the night. So Mark. Thank you, Heather. Uh, I, first, I'd just like to thank the board. Um, I can't imagine the amount of time, thought, energy that the board has put into this. I know it's, uh, we, we are lucky to have a very thoughtful board. So I just wanted to say, I appreciate all the time and the work you've put into this. Um, my first comment is just a quick one about the start of the school year. I was a little bit surprised to learn that we were going to start uh, uh, before Labor Day, if I, at least if I understood it right. Uh, I think in the past several years, we've started after Labor Day. And uh, thinking about uh, being in hot classrooms with no AC, with masks on. Uh, it might, it might be, uh, you know, in terms of returning to the school, maybe as late in September as possible, um, might be, might be uh, advisable. But my, my main comment uh, would echo what some of my colleagues have, have said, um, and that's about the hybrid schedule. Um, I, I'm personally concerned um, about the hybrid model uh, being worth returning to the building for. Um, I'm just not sure that the educational benefits uh, will necessarily be that great compared to the potential health effects, uh, the risk to our students, our staff, the community. And I think that we, we should consider further reducing the number of students in the building. I know the district has sent out surveys over the past couple of weeks uh, that focus on identifying which students and staff can't physically be in the building. Uh, for health reasons. Um, however, I would encourage the district to instead ask which students must be in the building and to only have those students physically in school next year uh, and have everyone else be remote. Um, uh, we, we know that there are students uh, who rely on special services, uh, have IEP needs, 504 needs, who would be dramatically better off in the building. Uh, we, I'm sure this is the case at the other schools, but I know at the high school, we, we know which students really struggled with remote learning last year, uh, whether they're academic reasons or emotional reasons. Uh, we already know who these students are. Uh, so uh, I, I would suggest a, a different approach to the hybrid, which would be having almost everybody be remote and having the students in the building who actually really need in-person support. Uh, and teachers quite possibly could even be available there uh, for students who are, you know, 100% remote, like 
almost all kids would be. Uh, they might be there to have a kid come in um, who needs some help uh, to answer a question. I, I would imagine uh, teachers would be much more comfortable being in the building under those circumstances. And I think this would make uh, many other problems much easier to address as well, busing, lunch concerns, teacher childcare. Uh, this would protect our students better, our, our families, uh, and, and also would protect uh, one of our town's most valuable assets uh, much better, which is, which is our school staff. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Amanda. Hi, everybody. Amanda Marsden. I teach kindergarten at Pond Cove. Uh, first of all, thank you to everybody that took the time out of your summers to do all of this planning, especially those people on the committees. Uh, my husband banned me from doing any more committees, so with two kids under three, so I wasn't able to join you this time around. Um, but um, my biggest concern, aside from just being in school in general, is around planning time. And a lot of that has been discussed already, what Liz had shared. And I know there are several people in our building who have students that go to school in other districts. And I support fully moving to the Wednesday date rather than the Friday for planning. And with that being said, um, a full day for planning. I think we're really um, creating a system that's unsustainable if we expect teachers and staff to be um, planning for in in person instruction and whatever the remote will look like um, with a half a day on a Friday afternoon I can say for sure I am cooked on Friday afternoon and it will be incredibly challenging to collaborate um, and really have meaningful work that will inform instruction throughout the the coming week on a Friday afternoon um, also I, I really think that excuse me, on any given day, um, at Pond Cove at least, we get 40 minutes to plan each day and that is it. So to then add on this additional task of, of splitting up groups and differentiating to the needs of those students and also really taking into account how important those first six, eight, 10 weeks of school are going to be and how everything is going to continue to be changing, the least we could be thrown is additional planning time that would adequately support our teachers and our staff. So um, I appreciate everybody so very much for your thoughtfulness. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm sorry, my voice is the last one you get to hear. So thanks. Okay. Um, I think we need to close this for this evening. There was a lot of information, a lot of thoughts, a lot of input, um, a lot to think about. Um, I'm gonna make a motion that we table the vote. We're, we're clearly not prepared as a board, I believe. Um, and so I'm just gonna go through and, and confirm with each board member that you are okay tabling it or commenting on that and we'll start with Kimberly and I suppose and and the rest of the um, of the rest of the agenda we had policies um, and so to table those Kimberly can you speak to that I uh, guess I concur tabling at this point is a good idea Elizabeth yes I think we need to table it for now okay hope uh, I agree with tabling it. I just want to note that I don't know that we were voting on anything concrete, like we're all going back to school, you know, we were voting on a general framework. Um, so my question is, if we're tabling it, what does that mean? Are we coming back to discuss it more? Or are we asking for clarifications? Like, how, what will the next step be? But I'm okay with tabling it. So for that purpose, yes. Um, I guess I'd just like to speak to that is that I'm not, I, I, I feel like there might not have been a chance for people and I would like to give just a little bit of time for people to write in an email or um, share their thoughts with us. I, I, I feel like I agree with you that we're, we're voting on something 
general and nothing specific. Um, yet I think uh, it's important for us to feel like we've heard everybody. And I feel like because of the timing of the evening and the way the, the meeting has um, elicited so much input that I don't feel like I haven't even been able to keep up and read all the chats. And so I haven't been able to keep all that in there. And so um, I would just like the opportunity to be able to make sure that I've heard everybody's thoughts and opinions first. So that is my reason for wanting to table it. That's all. Um, I guess I should suppose, Donna, are we on a time frame with this? It, are we able to well, table this? We do have school opening coming up and um, right. which we, means we would need a special business meeting um, you know, in two weeks. And, and would you recommend that we continue with our planning? Should we stop planning? Then and I'm worried about being ready for the beginning of school. Um, if we table this. Um, the plan is a very general plan. It's not a specific plan. So I think to work within the framework of that plan is what we're going to end up doing anyway. Um, it would give us some direct, we need some direction at this point about, um, you know, and we do have school coming up. So um, knowing, you know, we don't have to make a decision tonight, you know, what each little detail will be, but knowing that the general plan is in place to move forward. So for us to vote for the plan does not mean that, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the concerns that came up, it does not limit us from correct potentially changing things or having the conversations of concerns that came up tonight. Correct. So I'm going to do a 180 because while I do feel it's really important that we hear from the public and that we answer questions and we continue conversation, um, I felt coming into this meeting that we were voting on something general that we needed to have in place for school. I was swayed a little bit. I do really want to hear comment. However, I'm back to my original position that we need to vote on this tonight. I'm starting to think that as well in the regards to give the administration um, some time to move forward with this and, and, and have a general plan. Um, it also sounds like through conversations I've had with you, Donna, that um, now it gets down to, with this bigger, more general plan, now it gets down to the buildings and how, how do, how do they make it work in the nitty gritty um, with the concerns that are being heard? Um, okay, um, so that's whole. So that's whole. That's Kimberly. Could Heather? Could I just? Um, so I guess I feel a little uncomfortable with the calendar piece that we, you know, we voted for that right off the bat, but then we've heard a lot of commentary and there was a lot in the chat about that. And um, I, I, I feel uncomfortable um, right now with, with that piece, I guess. Just putting it out there, I don't know. Um, I don't know, I just, I guess there was, I feel like we didn't uh, hear all the positions before mm -hmm. we voted. Good point. So, a uh, comment, um, I think one of the questions people in the chat is asking, I think the biggest thing is they're asking about the Wednesday. And before asking about the Wednesday, I asked, I think earlier, on the calendar, before I even asked my uh, religious day on the Elizabeth read my mind, of course, naturally, she always does that. And uh, so, the question I ask, is it possible to change? And I'm asking the same question. After the discussion, is it possible to change? If it's not possible to change, why have discussion? And I think it is uh, the Department of Education, it is the state, it is the CDC. We are, we are opening school. So 
I'm not saying that it's from my perspective, it's from the state perspective. Like it or not, students have to go back to school. Just like me with the city hall, I mean, I don't want to go, but I have to go to earn my money. And they set protocols how to do that. As uh, Chris Hope uh, in the town council beautifully said in one of the meetings in reference to pizza, the plan is that we have pizza. The question is, do we want pepperoni pizza, vegetable pizza, what kind of pizza we want? So as long as Donna can say, or the administration can say that we are flexible to accommodate ourselves, just as the, the virus is accommodating or not accommodating to us, is constantly changing, I think we should vote on it and go forward. Okay, thank you, you for that, Nasser. You add that language in there somehow. Yeah. Phil, do you have a comment or Laura? I, I'll let Phil go first. Go ahead, Laura. Oh, I was just gonna say, I feel comfortable voting on the plan, knowing that the plan is subject to change, but giving it in the administration's control to construct that plan and continue their work and not derail them. Phil, and then Hope, I see your hand. Yeah, so I, I'd agree. I mean, I, and just to be clear what we're voting on, I'm reading the, you know, I've read it, carefully the framework for returning to classroom instruction um, and it's a it's a general plan it's it's what we would all want from my perspective I think a lot of work whether it's Wednesdays or Fridays or Monday Tuesday you know the specifics I, I think need to be con uh, continue to be thought through particularly from what we've heard tonight but this framework um, really sets forth about if we go and when we go what it looks like what are the health considerations how do we test um, hand hygiene. I mean, it, it, it's the kind of thing that I felt very comfortable with supporting tonight beforehand. The specifics, I agree. We can continue to talk about it, but I'd hate to see that framework linger when we only have four weeks left before people need to go to school and the administrators will continue, and teachers, um, I, I would hope, um, continue to have these conversations about the specifics. So I, I'm comfortable voting on this framework tonight. Okay, thank you, Phil. Hope. So, um, so I just wanted to follow up um, with respect to the Wednesday. So I, I understood the explanation was that all of Cumberland County was going to use Wednesday and then some schools went off and did something different. So now we're in the situation where do we follow them? We may, have, it sounds like there's a good amount of uh, preference for Wednesday. It seems somewhat absurd that all that Cumberland County can't just say this is what we're all going to do to fix this problem because it's a, it's a shared problem. Um, and you, you want to respond to that, Donna? And I have, I have one other point to make, but go ahead, Donna. Yeah, so I just want to say that we all agreed, all agreed, except for Portland wasn't there to Fridays. Mm -hmm. And then Portland went with Wednesday. And because Portland went with Wednesday, South Portland went with Wednesday. And I don't know how Falmouth ended up changing. But anyway, that's the that's a sequence of events. So got it. Yeah, I I I see I see that I understand how it happened. And I'm just saying let's not make it a, a battle of wills. You right. know, it makes oh, no, it's definitely not a battle of wills. <laughs> Um, and then my other point was to, to um, John um, Delisle made a point that I've been saying all along, which is we had one case in March and we shut down. And now we're talking about all these different, um, you know, we have 300 active, over almost 400 active cases now. So I sort of see everything except the remote option as sort of a fiction somewhat and that we're going to be going in and I'm just hoping and, and I'm believing that we're going to be well prepared for 100% remote learning because that is very likely where we're going to end up come flu season. Um, so I know, it, it, I, don't want, I don't want the an adoption of this plan to, to be the school board's blessing that we're all ready to go back into school because I don't see it that way. Um, but again, I'm okay with tabling it, but I, I don't see what the plan is for that. Like, did we, do we come back in two days? Do we get to have more input? We're turning this into a workshop somewhat and it was meant to be sort of an up or down and you know yeah that's it yeah um well thank you for that hope and everyone else and it sounds like uh the 
consensus is to go ahead and vote that it's general enough and that um, and that all we're doing is giving the administration um, the go ahead to keep keep moving forward with their plans and it's not about specifics. Um, I'd like to hear from Laura as well before we make that final decision. Laura, would you like to? Am I still on mute? I thought I, I was sorry. I thought I, I already said to, yes, I agree that we are voting on the general plan right. and giving the administration, the committee, uh, you know, process to move forward in their planning. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so I have lost my little sheet here. Uh, so then for the vote, can we just review? I know Phil mentioned it uh, a moment ago. Can we just review it for consideration to a plan for fall reopening of school? Um, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay. Um, I think we will table the policies for tonight. Um, and instead of going through each individual board, if you have a problem with that now, if you are we table those, Donna, go ahead. Well, I think the purpose Donna. of this, and hope, correct me if I'm wrong, but was just to share these policies. We are under a time crunch because the law changes as of August 14th. So we wanted, I think we wanted to share these with the board and possibly be ready to vote at the next meeting. I, I can talk really fast. Okay. Okay. You're um, on. And Kathy, I mentioned so you discussing it, but I don't think we need to go into great detail. Essentially, there has been actual changes to the federal level fed, uh, Title IX regulations uh, that we've been waiting for for several years now, and they finally become law. And they've been um, uh, school districts have to have new policies uh, and procedures in place uh, effective August 14th. So we're in a time crunch. What you're seeing in the package tonight are the sample policies that have been developed by the Maine School Management Association. Uh, there are very little change from our existing uh, policies, and it's policies AC and ACAA and ACAB, which are um, our anti-discrimination policy and the uh, sexual harassment and harassment policies. And so what I'd like you all to do is take a look at the changes. Um, essentially, they got a little bit, uh, uh, a fair amount more clear on the definitions of sexual harassment. Uh, there's Title IX harassment, and then there's main law harassment. Uh, I'm hoping we can have a policy meeting between now and the next business meeting. Any public input would be appreciated at that meeting, and then we can vote to adopt at the next meeting so we can be in compliance come start of school. Any questions? Thank you for that update. Thanks, Hope. Yeah. Um, so the final item, agenda, consideration to adjourn. May I have a motion, please? I move we, I move we adjourn. I have a second. I'll second that. Um, OK, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Uh, Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Mm -hmm. I think I heard a yay. Laura Danino. Yay. All right. That concludes the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for your time, for your thoughtfulness, for your care. Um, these are very decisions that have been done. I appreciate everybody's. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Night.